paper and you link it to something else, but I've got to say um, that degree of uh, cleverness was not on display today. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12220 in the name of Marco Biaggi on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Marco Biaggi to speak to and move the motion. Mr Biaggi, when you're ready. Yes. 14 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, I want to begin uh, this stage one debate by thanking a lot of other people as well. It very much is a lot of people, because uh, even though the name suggests this is stage one, suggests the first stage, all of us parliamentarians know how much work uh, has gone into this and any other bill already before we get here. Uh, my colleague and predecessor, Derek Mackay, took what began as a scattered set of suggestions in the SNP manifesto, tended them through two consultations, 40 engagement events, and helped them spring forth into today's community empowerment bill. All I can say is he took much better care of them than he did the plant in what is now my office in Victoria Quay. I'd also like to thank the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their consideration of the bill, but most of all the two subject committees, Kevin Stewart and the members of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, along with Rob Gibson and the members of the RACI Committee, who looked at part four on community right to buy in particular. Together, they've produced a ream of recommendations. The government is considering all of them closely in advance of stage two, and I mean that a ream. The paper I have in front of me runs to 44 pages alone. And they were helped in that, uh, no doubt, by the, the conscious efforts they made to take evidence from an unusually wide range of organisations and individuals. As I said, the government will consider these recommendations and we will also examine any ideas put forward today in the spirit of making this bill the best bill we can possibly uh, make it. Sessions for the committee took place in Fort William and Dumfries, along with innovative use of social media and online video to help explain aspects of the bill. And for me, it's heartening to see colleagues make it easy for people to participate in the development of a bill that should be all about participation. So thanks are due also to everyone who took some time to offer their views and experiences to the committee or to the Scottish Government. And I have to say that time and time again from organisations and from many individuals, I've heard a, a real confidence, a really encouraging confidence that the bill will make a real difference and help make public bodies and agencies look at community empowerment in a different way. And today I come to this debate to present this bill, to endorse its aims and to ask for members on all sides to join together to back it. We all know communities can do great things when empowered to achieve their goals, when given the freedom to choose their own path, responsibility over their own surroundings and are trusted to take their own decisions. Already in places like Craig Miller, Inverness, Govan Hill, Irvine and Kilmarnock, I've met grassroots groups who are each doing remarkable things within their own communities and doing so in their own way and on their own terms. There's just so much talent out there. It needs a bit of self-belief, some encouragement and for unnecessary obstacles to be taken out of the way. And that is what the Community Empowerment Bill sets out to do. By creating new rights for community bodies and new duties on a whole range of public authorities, it provides a new legal framework and hopefully stimulates the growth of the new mindset that you can never legislate for that will promote and encourage community empowerment and participation. And since the bill was introduced in June last year, the demand for that participation and empowerment has only grown. Our historic referendum proved, as if proof were needed, that people will get involved when they know the issues at stake and know they can make a difference to them. And across this chamber, we believe in more powers for this parliament because that too is a form of bringing control over decision-making closer to the people that it affects. We now need to build on this new sense of what can be achieved. This legislation contributes to that spirit, that purpose of democratic renewal, and does so tangibly in ways you can instantly recognise, even if sometimes, yes, I accept from the local government uh, committee, that it can be hidden by a bit of gobbledygook. We've done our best to produce easy read uh, policy memorandums, and we will be putting the guidance in plain English, but that recommendation, more than anything, is taken. 
Part one of the bill takes the, the national outcomes approach, which is currently represented by Scotland Performs, puts it in statute with duties on the Scottish Government to develop, to consult on, to publish, to review and report on what we should think of as a set of indicators for the kind of Scotland we want to see. For the community of the whole nation, that has to be and will be an empowering process. By also putting community planning partnerships into statute in part two, we will develop the role and performance of CPPs, not least in ensuring public bodies work together in these bodies and with the public. Part three's participation requests will give communities a new power to enter into dialogue with public authorities to ensure their voices are always heard. This simple power will remind everyone that communities should always be around the table when decisions affecting them are being taken. Part four of the bill, meanwhile, led by my colleague, the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, deals with the community right to buy that exists within the Land Reform Act. This part of the bill will simplify the process, make it more flexible to use, extend the type of community bodies that are able to access the community right to buy, and crucially, expand the extent of those communities that can take forward such a right. Community right to buy will be extended from rural Scotland to all of Scotland. <coughs> community right to buy is also extended by introducing a right to buy neglected or abandoned land, even if there is no willing seller. We do recognise that committees and stakeholders have all asked for clarification of what type of land is covered by this, and we have sought the views of stakeholders and discussed with them what would be required. My colleague, the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, will therefore provide draft regulations that will detail those matters which must be considered when determining whether or not land is neglected or abandoned in advance of stage two. These matters could, for example, include the physical condition of the land, the use, or lack of use to which it is being put, and the effect that that has on the surrounding land. Moving on, part five will make it easier for communities to take control of a public asset, whether that's a community centre, a patch of public land or whatever. The sky is the limit for what the ingenuity and local knowledge released by community participation can achieve. The common good asset registers in part six will mean more transparency over these, as well as increased community involvement in the decisions taken about them. Part seven will create a new duty on local authorities to keep a waiting list of those wanting an allotment, paired with a duty to, quote, take reasonable steps, unquote, to ensure those waiting lists do not grow too long. Let me be clear, this will mean more allotments. Ms. Crawford. Um, I think all uh, MSPs have been in receipt of a piece of lobbying from the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society. Now, for whatever reason, the society feel threatened by the legislation, perceived or real. I'm not sure what the, the real issue is there for them. However, would a potential way forward, if the Minister could give an, in, could give, um, an indication he'd be prepared to support the exploration of grandfather rights um, for individuals who are already in uh, allotment areas who continue to, to keep these rights in future and we could enshrine that in law and any new allotments that were created could follow under the, 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 the legislation that's being proposed. And that may be a potential solution to help everyone through this difficulty. Minister. Well, on, on Friday, I spoke to Ian Welsh of the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society and committed to consulting on using one of the powers that the bill creates over the issue of size. Um, we would be aiming to do so uh, in ways that addresses concerns about size while also allowing flexibility to ensure those who want differently sized plots can have their needs met as well. But this is something that is focused on uh, the people that are coming into allotments. Clearly, anybody that has an existing lease or agreement under uh, the existing legislation with a local authority is going to come into a lot of contract, a lot of rental law there, and that is certainly something that we could look at. I don't believe that the changes would lead to uh, significant uh, impacts on existing uh, contracts in that regard, although councils do have the ability to review rents, and in any rental contract they would have that. There is a possibility that we could look at what additional rights are coming in and examine uh, how we could have uh, transitional arrangements or indeed ongoing arrangements where that might be disadvantageous. But I would come to this chamber saying that this set of additional rights for allotments takes, um, takes areas that haven't been legislated for, in some cases for 123 years, 
and creates additional rights in, uh, as far as I can tell, in every uh, area certainly I've been looking at today. But this is an area of ongoing dialogue and I will continue to speak to the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society so that we do understand each other and we are able to, to reach an agreement. Finally, uh, Part 8 uh, will allow councils, uh, after, after that it seems like it might be a, a last but not least, but Part 8 will allow councils to support and encourage businesses in target areas within their areas through local business rate relief schemes. Now, together, each of these parts provide new measures individually, but together they help change the culture, we hope, around community empowerment to make such local approaches routine. We recognise, however, that if all of our communities are to be empowered, some communities will require support. The Local Government Committee were right to highlight this, and we wish to see all communities able to keep up in the race to take advantage of these new powers. At stage two, therefore, we will not be standing still ourselves. Alongside the committee evidence, we've already been discussing and debating with partners and stakeholders how the bill might be improved on what was introduced to Parliament seven months ago. We propose to include amendments uh, to appeal procedures for asset transfer requests and the publication of asset registers. But the central change has to be an even greater focus on reducing inequalities. Now, our bill stands alongside a whole range of existing duties and policies targeted in this area. And we believe that inequalities are reduced by empowering communities, that where communities lead their own regeneration, control their own future, they will take the right steps forward. We will, however, bring amendments to ensure that both the national outcomes and community planning approaches align to reducing inequalities. But we also intend to require public bodies to make inequality a material concern in making decisions on the key participation requests and asset transfer mechanisms. We want to see those communities that have been most excluded take those well-deserved seats at the table and those that have been most disempowered take control of their own surroundings. Today, the Cabinet Secretary therefore announced an extra £5.6 million for the People and Community Fund. This will be part of the overall Empowering Communities pot, which now stands at £19.4 million of support. With the aim of empowering these communities, we've also been particularly impressed by participatory budgeting, where funding decisions are taken directly by the people affected. Scottish Government-funded PB training events over recent months have drawn crowds from public bodies and local authorities, and we've received a great deal of interest in our offer for new PB projects. We know of around two dozen that have taken place in the last decade already, including the well-established Leith Decides, which is going ahead this weekend. Together with the Cabinet Secretary, I've consulted the Participatory Budgeting Working Group and I'm considering options, including legislative, to ensure this agenda moves forward. Participatory budgeting is a relatively new form of community engagement, but public bodies have been doing or have known how to do community engagement very well for many years. The national standards for community engagement have been the basis for this, and I intend to use them as the foundation for guidance on community participation that will go to community planning partnerships under new statutory guidance powers. CPPs must be the forum where high-level decisions are taken for entire authority areas, but there is much to commend. Similar partnership approaches also being taken more locally, where grassroots community groups in all their diversity can more easily input directly. On Saturday, I will be visiting a charrette. I'm afraid I'm in my final minute. Uh, we'll be visiting a charrette hosted by Glasgow Canal's Regeneration Partnership, where the community can come together just like that with facilitators and designers and over a few days develop an image or set of options for the design of their community. Charettes are a participatory approach to planning. They've been supported by the Scottish Government for four years, and they are just one of the countless examples already out there of people coming together to play their part in their own future. Presiding officer, I don't want to say we need to up our game because there are clearly so many great examples of excellence out there already. But we have a unique opportunity with this bill to ensure that our greatest asset, the people who live and work in Scotland, are even better able to make decisions about their future on their terms. We believe, will believe and always have believed that if they do so, they will be better decisions. This bill is an opportunity we must come together today to seize. I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill.
Thank you. At this stage of the debate, I have a little bit of time in hand if members wish to take interventions. I call on Kevin Stewart to speak on behalf of the Local Government Regeneration Committee. Ten minutes, please, Mr Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm pleased to speak in this debate on behalf of my colleagues in the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. I'd like to start by thanking the current and past members of the committee for the work that they've undertaken, not only in scrutinising this bill, but also in the wider topic of community empowerment. The committee has been examining community empowerment in one form or another for the last three years. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit more on this later. Uh, I also want to extend my thanks to all of the witnesses who provided written and oral evidence to the committee, as well as the hundreds of people from all over Scotland who took part in various community engagement events with us. Thanks are also due to all of the people who helped facilitate the committee's various fact-finding visits across Scotland over those last three years. This proved to be invaluable preparation for our scrutiny of this legislation. Can I also take the opportunity to thank our colleagues in the Delegated Powers and Finance Committee for their scrutiny of the bill. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to thank the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee uh, uh, under the convenership of uh, Rob Gibson for their consideration of part four of the bill on community right to buy. Uh, I know that this work proved to be a big ask for a, a committee with a very full programme of work. However, my colleagues and I greatly appreciate the knowledge and expertise the members of the Rural Affairs Committee brought to the examination of community right to buy. We've accepted their recommendations uh, to us in full. I'm sure members of the Rural Affairs Committee will say more about this during uh, the debate. I'd also like to thank the <coughs> former minister, uh, Derek Mackay, and all of the various officials at the Scottish Government who worked to bring this legislation to fruition. And I hope that uh, we can work in tandem uh, with the current minister to ensure uh, that we make this bill uh, the best that it possibly can be. <coughs> Uh, Presiding Officer Ernest Hemingway once said that the best way to find out if you can trust somebody uh, is to trust them. Uh, I think this piece of advice neatly sums up the core philosophy at the heart of the Community Empowerment Bill. On first glance, it may be difficult to see a unifying theme to this legislation as it seems to cover so many different areas. But in truth, the unifying themes at the heart of this bill is trust. Trust that communities all over Scotland know what's best for them and have the desire and ability to help bring their ambitions to reality. Trust that despite all of the challenges they have faced and will continue to face, our public services can work together to empower communities and deliver the outcomes they need. Trust that communities can make better use of public assets, such as buildings or lands, than local authorities or the wider public sector can. And trust that CPP partners will help facilitate that public trust by being able to work in partnership with communities. So, President Officer, this bill is not about imposing a framework or compelling various public bodies to undertake various actions we wish them to undertake. It is about providing communities across Scotland with the tools they need to take decisions for themselves and trusting them to use those tools wisely. In short, it's about putting the power in community empowerment. I'll take uh, Ms McAlpine. Joan McAlpine. Uh, for taking the intervention. Um, in terms of compelling uh, organisations to do things, you'll be aware that the Scottish Woodlot Association has raised concerns about the Forestry Act 1967, which uh, prevents community groups taking Forestry Commission land for uh, use um, for woodland projects. And I wonder what the committee um, view was on that. Kevin Stewart. I thank Ms McAlpine uh, for her, her intervention. Um, only uh, just yesterday, uh, Sunday and yesterday in fact, uh, Andy Brown of the Scottish Woodlot Association has been in touch uh, with the committee uh, and he's pleased that we have the recommendation uh, that the Forestry Commission Scotland should be able to lease state forest land uh, to uh, not-for-profit cooperatives. And I think that helps the Scottish Woodland, Woodlot Association and what they're trying to achieve, and I hope that is the case. 
Uh, I've mentioned trust. Now, with all trust comes a, a degree of risk, presiding officer. Indeed, risk is at the very heart of what it means to trust. Uh, and as we have heard during our evidence taking on this bill, many public sector stakeholders are keenly aware of potential risks that may arise as a, as a result of the change this bill will help to foster. However, from the widespread community engagement we have undertaken as a committee, uh, we feel confident this legislation will not only benefit communities, but also the wider public service. In our scrutiny of the bill, we have made uh, great efforts to engage with the people uh, that the bill will affect. Uh, firstly, since early 2012, uh, we have sought to use our entire work programme to take opportunities to examine community empowerment and inform ourselves of how it has developed as a mechanism for delivering change over the last decade or more. Over the last three years, the Local Government Committee has taken advantage of seven major pieces of work to examine the issue of community empowerment. Our scrutiny of the Local Government Finance Unoccupied Properties Bill, our Strand 3 Inquiry on Public Services Reform, which saw us undertake three interlinked inquiries over 18 months, our scrutiny of the 2013-14 draft budget, our scrutiny of the third national planning framework, and most recently, our inquiry into the delivery of regeneration in Scotland. Secondly, uh, we have taken every opportunity to communicate with real people and communities across uh, the length and breadth of Scotland, uh, and to do so in as clear a manner as possible. Uh, we have undertaken 10 uh, fact-finding uh, visits and have had four full meetings of the committee outside Edinburgh. Uh, we have visited uh, places as, uh, as diverse as Kelso, Cumbernauld, Paisley, Mabel, Stornoway, Dumfries and Fort William. During these visits, we've held roundtable discussions with local people and community groups about community empowerment. Clark's estimated that over 600 people have attended these engagement sessions in person, with more joining in via social media. Thirdly, the committee has very much taken to heart the reform agenda set forth by the presiding officer to engage with the people of Scotland as widely as possible using modern technology. To this end, we have made widespread use of both Twitter and Facebook to engage with people and garner their views in the bill. We have also recently established the first ever Scottish Parliament Committee Instagram account to make use of the visual evidence we have collated. And during our visit to Stornoway, uh, we held a live interactive Twitter discussion in both English and Gaelic with people in all three island uh, authorities. This focused on what the, those communities felt they needed to empower themselves. Presiding officer, we have also uh, had uh, some YouTube videos made, and I would ask members uh, to have a, a look at that. And in terms of uh, the, the actual uh, situations that we have found, we have made differences to people's lives already in the course of dealing with this bill. Uh, we, we visited uh, Dumfries, and our video highlights the excellent work of a community group called The Usual Place in Dumfries, and the vital services they are providing in the Dumfries and Galloway area, such as a changing place's toilet. I'm happy to say that the committee was able to play a small role in helping this worthy organisation secure a lease with Dumfries and Galloway Council on a property for their use. This, we believe, is a good example uh, of, of, uh, of community empowerment at, at, at its best. Uh, I must pay thanks to the media team for uh, allowing us uh, the opportunity uh, to actually participate in these videos. The Minister mentioned gobbledygook and official speak, and I think that's a great turn-off uh, for many folks who want to become involved. And I, I'm glad that the Minister has, uh, has raised this today, and I hope that uh, he will uh, continue to follow the committee's line that we must eradicate this so that we allow for the maximum amount of participation possible. Uh, let's look at our findings and recommendations. In part one of the bill, uh, we address national outcomes. Given the focus placed on scrutiny of outcomes, we consider the Scottish Government should report annually on the extent to which national outcomes have been achieved. This would inform the Parliament's budget scrutiny process. Such reports should be available before the publication of the annual draft Scottish budget each year. Part two of the bill relates to community planning. As a committee, we are concerned local communities are not sufficiently and directly involved with community planning partnerships. We recommend the government amends the bill to require CPPs to seek involvement from a level below that of community representative, as well as, uh, as set out how this involvement will be assessed. There should be an explicit requirement on all CPPs to include community capacity building in local plans and to report on progress in every annual report. 
Uh, part three of the bill deals with participation requests. There can be no doubt, presiding officer, this bill is generally a well welcome boost towards putting power in the hands of communities. However, for a bill which is designed to empower, the committee was struck by the requirement that only groups with a written constitution could submit a participation request. This seems to be out of step with the whole ethos of the bill, and in the words of Jeannie McKenzie, who responded to our video on participation requests, she says, sometimes an individual has a very good idea for improving public services, but lacks the time or opportunity to find others and form a constituted group. So we recommend the bill be amended to allow individuals to submit participation requests. Given the need to legislate in this area, it is vital that progress in participation requests is closely monitored. So we also recommend the bill requires all public service authorities to produce periodic public reports, uh, which is in paragraph 261 to 270, 270 of our report, which sets out recommendations for the areas to be covered by this process. As I've already stated, part four of the bill on community right to buy was considered by the Rural Affairs Committee, so I will leave members to the, uh, of that committee to speak about that issue. Part five deals with asset transfers. Some of our recommendations in this area are directed at the changes required to public bodies to ensure the intention of the bill is achieved in practice. Uh, this will require, again, close monitoring. Part six relates to the management of common good assets. Given the approach outlined by the Minister during oral evidence taking, we so see no difficulty in the bill specifying a maximum timescale for the comp compilation of common good registers. I'm afraid uh, I must ask you to come to a close. Part seven relates to allotments, and we've already heard uh, a little bit about that from members, uh, and we have made recommendations there too. And part eight deals with uh, non-domestic rates, uh, and I may come back to that later if I get to intervene. In, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, I, I, I think I go back to the first principle of this. All of this is about trust. It's about time that we trusted our communities, and I hope that we will do so, and that we, and I commend our report on stage one of the, uh, of the Community Empowerment Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I now call on Alec Riley. Ten minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from Lyndon Johnson, where he says, you do not examine legislation in the light of the benefits it will convey if properly administered, but in light of the wrongs it would do and the harm it would cause if improperly administered. And for me, that's a good starting point, I think, with this bill, because I welcome the fact that the Minister today and the Cabinet Secretary previously have indicated that they do want to have much further discussion and they are willing to look at addressing some of the issues in this bill as we come forward to stage two. And, and, and certainly for the Labour Party's point of view, we um, are supportive of the principle of this bill, but we do recognise that there's a need, there's a need for, 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 for greater clarity in terms of the bill. There's still far too many questions unanswered. I mean, to highlight one, I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully go through a few in the 10 minutes, but the participation request, if there's no right to appeal um, and, and, and the uncertainty that's there, um, then in some senses, what would be the point? There is the need for teeth and to have more strength in terms of this bill. Marco Biaggi talks about inequalities are reduced when you empower communities. Um, and, 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 and I wouldn't disagree with that, but I really say to you that I'm not sure in terms of this bill, and it's been highlighted, and I'll say more about it, particularly if you're aiming at those communities that are the least empowered at the present time. Um, there is a real worry coming through all the evidence of the committee report, etc. So I think that this bill needs more strength and more teeth if we're serious about community empowerment, and I'm not sure that it actually goes there. And therefore, I think there is a greater need. There's a great need for much improvement in terms of this bill itself. And that's why I would commend Kevin Stewart and the Local Government Committee for the exhaustive work that they have carried out, because they have brought forward the report with a whole range of detailed recommendations that demonstrate 
that not only have they been very active in taking evidence, but they have listened to that evidence, and there is a whole range of recommendations that, 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 that they bring forward that I am sure will form the basis of discussions that we can have with the government as we start to move forward. I would want to draw attention to the, the Finance Committee report, um, because I think uh, we, we, we can't go past today without highlighting the fact that, that the committee, while acknowledging that there are difficulties faced in quantifying the potential future costs from services that will be demand-driven, uh, but they remain concerned that despite the requirements of standing orders, best estimates have not been fully provided. Now, there are a number of local authorities, uh, presiding officer, that gave evidence to the Finance Committee and indeed to the Local Government and Communities Committee, and they highlighted very many concerns um, that, that, that are echoed perhaps through East Lothian, who, who say that, that uh, local government will incur extra costs as a result of these provisions. Um, a new legislative burden, and it may not be possible to allocate money to these. And they go on in Berkeley, Glasgow City Council, uh, North Ayrshire, North Lanark. All these councils raise concerns, and I think legitimately they raise concerns, um, because the, the, the bill team confirmed that it would be part of the normal discussions with local authorities through annual, through annual budget and processes. Local authorities would have to demonstrate and quantify what uh, was involved and go through the discussions with the Scottish Government. But the fact is that we know at this time that local authorities are in a position where they are cutting frontline services the length and breadth of Scotland, regardless of the political colour of the local authority, not at this stage, regardless of the, the colour of the political authority. My concern in raising this is not about local government finance, it is that if the monies are not available, um, then cost itself and, and, and the theory cost could become a barrier within public organisations when trying to um, hopefully move this bill forward with the spirit that is intended. So the Finance Committee flag up those points, Mr Stewart's committee flags up those points, and it is important that we flag them up today. The committee believed that this was such a major concern that in the report they want to draw the attention of the finances to the Parliament today. Yeah. Kevin Stewart. Um, the committee uh, was divided in that point, but it would be fair to say that there were some concerns. Um, would Mr uh, Rowley agree with the Scottish Community Alliance Director Angus Hardy, who says uh, that while recognising the validity of the concerns highlighted by the committee with regard to the financial memorandum, the Scottish Community Alliance would urge MSPs to support the passage of the bill to the next stage? And would you agree with that, uh, Mr Rowley, that we should allow for the bill to go to the next stage? Alec Rowley. Well, I've said, I've said to Kevin Stewart that the, the principle of community impairment is one that, that the, the Scottish Labour Party absolutely support. But there are serious questions, and those questions over finance should be raised with this Parliament. I mean, that's, that's just a, a fact. Yep. And I thank the member for allowing the intervention. Um, would the member um, agree with me that some of his opening comments about the poor, poor legislation and the challenges in this bill, would he agree with the latest statement from the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society, where they ask for the Section 7 um, from the bill in order to make it a separate legislation? Alec Riley. Yeah, I thank the member for, for intervention. I, I, what I would say is that um, I should probably declare an interest as a, a very keen um, allotment grower. But what I would say is that I think there needs to be further discussion with the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society because I think they raise a number of issues there that, with the greatest respect, the Minister did not address in, in the, in, the intervention in question from, from Kevin Stewart. And I actually think one of the points that they make there... Yeah. Minister. On the issue of discussion with the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society, I've, I've been out, I've visited an allotment, I met with them. I discussed the five points that they were putting forward. We talked about it. I talked on the phone on Friday with the president of the organisation. And there has been a continuing dialogue. That dialogue will go on. But it's very important to try and identify what it is that they are looking for. And I think right now that's the, that's the sticking point for, for what we need to do in the legislation. But my door is open and my Alec phone is Riley. on. I, I, 
I agree with the Minister on the five points that they make, I think, will start the basis of a discussion. I actually think that the, the letter that they have submitted is the missed opportunity that, that were not taken in terms of this bill, linking it to the food strategy, linking it to health and wellbeing, of course, coming in through the community planning partnerships and, and building it into local community plans at a local area. So I actually believe that they rightly point out that there's a missed opportunity. We should be able to have those discussions, and I'm happy to join the Minister in those discussions because, as I say, I'm very much a keen allotment grower and I would like to see allotments expand. If I can very quickly, in the time that I have, highlight a few other issues that I would like to, to go through. The Inclusion Scotland talk about an absence of genuine and meaningful community capacity building and engagement. The opportunities created by the bill will not be uh, equally uh, distributed. Communities which are the most marginalised, fractured and impoverished are likely to benefit least, while communities already rich in resources and human assets are likely to benefit most through their acquisition of new assets, part three the bill. The committee itself highlights those very same points and all I would say is I think these are genuine points and we really need to take them on board. Um, they also highlight the definition of community and I have to say I was quite surprised in reading that brief this morning because uh, I thought that we, we were saying that we would look at community much more widely and I thought that was the position of the government but I read the brief this morning and discovered that and, and given evidence to one of the committees that was, that was is not what we've said, so I think we, we, need, we need to take that, that point on board. If we are serious, going back to the point I made at the start and the point the Minister made in introducing us, if we are serious about tackling inequalities and tackling poverty, then empowerment is one part of that. Um, getting community planning right is one part of that. And I have previously, um, in a previous role, met with the Finance Secretary and, 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 and had a discussion, and I'm absolutely committed to the idea of community planning. Um, but in order to do that, we must recognise the points that Inclusion Scotland are, are, are making. In terms of believe that Inclusion Scotland believes the requirement placed on community groups to request participation uh, disempowers rather than empowers communities as it leaves the powers with the public bodies, which in instead should have a duty to engage with communities. Again, some very serious points that I think we've got to pick up and we've got to, to look at if we're serious about the principles of this bill. And all those points are highlighted in the evidence for the committee. We then go to this other briefing that I read this morning that came in for, for Bernardo's, Oxfam and others. And I do note that they talk about participatory budgeting, and it's something the Minister said that he's interested in, and there has been some, some pots put in there. I would also say that, that I'm a big believer that there is a fourth tier of government in Scotland, and that fourth tier is community councils. Um, now, a lot of people criticise community councils. We discussed it in the committee itself and say that community councils often tell you what they're against rather than what they're for. In my own constituency, there were three community councils that had elections only a few months ago. The turnout was 22-23%, which isn't bad when you consider that in the by-election in Kirkcaldy it was 27%, which I actually thought was good for a by-election. So, you know, there was 20-odd there was percent of the communities in Kelty, the community in Carndon, and the community in Long Finance that turned out to elect local community councillors. And the argument, if you go back to the local government report that was produced, previously looking at impairment and looking at voting patterns etc is that if it's perceived that councils have more powers then more people are likely to come out and vote likewise with the fourth tier of government in Scotland so there is a tier there and whether it's getting these types of budgets down through participating budgets or actually getting budgets down to a local level to empower communities to be able to take local action I think it's worth further um, exploring um, and, to to and, close, and the point that, that, that they actually make there. I will, I will pull this to a close, but I would say that this right to request to participate, we have to look at that again because it, you can't have that without a proper appeals. To conclude, presiding officer, Scottish Labour are absolutely committed to empowering communities. We need a progressive agenda that puts far more power 
into this Parliament from Westminster, but actually coming out of this Parliament into local communities. That's the way ahead. This bill needs a lot more work. We're certainly up for working with the government and with, with partners to ensure that we actually can move things forward. Thank you. And to now call in Cameron Buchanan. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This bill before us contains some provisions that I agree with and some that I don't, but I do welcome the principle of community empowerment. I'm just not sure if this bill truly empowers communities in the most appropriate way. Although there have been areas of broad agreement, there remain a number of concerns that I wish to raise today in the hope that further discussion will help resolve the issues. It is vital that key terms in the bill are defined properly, but this unfortunately does not appear to be the case at present. In addition, it is a fundamental point that bills must be costed before they're put to Parliament for approval, and as yet this has not happened. Finally, I'd like to say that I welcome the general provisions regarding allotments, but wish to see greater clarity on this as the bill progresses. Before I begin to elaborate on the aspects of this bill, where I believe some work is needed, I'd like to reiterate my agreement with the principle of enabling local communities to have a greater say in their local areas. However, I'm not sure that this bill as it stands would empower communities in the most appropriate way. Furthermore, it is vital that definitions of when a community's right to buy can be enforced, they are set out very clearly. An absolute right to buy without strict and obvious conditions would set definitely a very damaging precedent that is neither fair nor in Scotland's best interests. My colleague, Mr Ferguson, will elaborate on these points in today's debate. One of the key aspects of the bill to be assessed as it passes through this Parliament is the estimate of the costs that will arise as a result of its provisions. In our report, the Committee has expressed its concern that the best estimate of costs arising from all provisions have not been provided, despite the requirements of standing orders. As Mr Rowley has said, I feel the need, too, to reiterate these concerns in the strongest terms, because this omission in particular regarding asset transfer or participation requests is a serious matter that must be addressed before the Bill goes to Stage 2. Members of this Parliament should not be expected to accurately debate the merits of this Bill without proper costings. We cannot be expected to sign off a blank cheque. We may hear the excuses that there are difficulties in quantifying future costs arising provisions from provisions that will depend on the amount of demand, but this I don't think is any excuse since the Committee in this Chamber expect estimates within accompanying ranges. I'm sure that many fellow members share my concerns in this regard, and I expect and hope that they will be addressed as soon as possible. Moving on to a particular aspect of the Bill, I will first of all say that I welcome its aims to make clear provisions regarding allotments. They are very valuable to many people in Scotland, and it is important to explore how we can help. Accordingly, I do agree with a number of provisions, but I'd like to raise two particular aspects that I believe should be considered. The first is provisions regarding the size of an allotment plot. The points that the committee heard regarding traditional plot sizes, they were right to highlight the need for plots to be of sufficient size, but I think it is perhaps unwise to assume that all allotment users wish to use them for the same reasons and for the same purpose. For example, some people use allotments purely as a hobby rather than as a means to feed a family. Furthermore, different areas will have varying local demands and differences regarding space available, as we heard in Fort William. The point I'm trying to underline is that a balance must be struck here. Allotment holders deserve a reasonably sized plot, but local authorities do need the flexibility to adapt to local circumstances and local demand. With this in mind, the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society, known as SAGS, as we've already heard, suggested a particular size could be just a reference standard that could be halved or quartered rather than an obligatory standard. This, I think, is worth detailed consideration. However, it does remain sensible for local authorities to have the flexibility to offer plot sizes that are most suitable locally. The second point I'd like to make on allotments is that in the interest of fairness, no supplier of grown produce should be expected through legislation from selling the produce locally in particular markets or shops. It is only fair that new producers are able to establish themselves without undue boundaries and local consumers should be able to buy and decide for themselves what they want. Before I conclude my remarks, I'd like to return to what I see as one of the most important points to be made at the bill, about the bill as it stands. I think it lacks clear, unambiguous definitions in many areas. I welcome the bill... I welcome the duty that the Bill places on local authorities to establish and maintain a register of all property and assets held for them for the common good. This duty will, amongst other things, help to increase the transparency. However, the definition of common good is not set out clearly, which may result in confusion during the Bill's implementation, as well as opportunities for provisions for it to be either extended or avoided. Accordingly, Presiding Officer, I do hope that today's debate shows a degree of agreement around some aspects of the Bill, some aspects of the bill whilst pressing concerns remain over any other provisions. 
It is important that with provisions regarding allotments, the correct balance is struck between protecting allotment holders' interests. Certainly, Mr. Rowley. Alec Dowley. Would, would Cameron, I thank Cameron Buchanan for giving the way. Would he agree that it is therefore crucial that we have some kind of financial estimates of the costs that could be incurred if we're serious about taking this bill forward and wanting it to work in local communities? Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I just tried to say that I think it's absolutely essential that we need the costs, or else the bill just cannot proceed. We have not had the costs and on all other matters, so I think it is essential. Anyway, I think it is important that with provisions regarding allotments, we strike a balance between protecting allotment holders' interests and allowing local authorities the flexibility they need to operate efficiently. After all, community empowerment should be about allowing local decisions to be made locally. However, it is vital that clear definitions are provided for each, each aspect that remain ambiguous. Otherwise, the interpretation of reach of this bill could be extended beyond its remit with controversial controversy, consequences. However, I would like to finish on a positive note by highlighting my sincere concern about the lack of financial information and reiterating, reiterating my expectation that this omission will be rectified. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate speeches of six minutes, please. Rob Gibson to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Well, thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Uh, the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee considered part four of the bill, and we reported our views to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, land reform is an ongoing and complex process, and uh, the part four provisions of the bill address some of the issues on this agenda. Once amended, these provisions should resolve the identified shortcomings of the Land Reform Scotland 2003 Act and achieve the aim to extend the community right to buy across Scotland. We welcome this. However, we agreed with some concerns about the drafting of the bill and about what is included and what is to be left uh, needing regulation and guidance later on. I'll come to that. Poseidon Officer, the Cabinet believes that uh, the complexity of aspects within Part 4 of the bill merit further explanation in the financial uh, and explanatory memoranda. Further consideration of the sustainable development and human rights could have facilitated a more constructive dialogue between landowners and communities. We understand that community right to buy will be uh, demand-led, so the costs for communities, for landowners and for public bodies are unclear. The financial memorandum omits to monitor the cost implications of Part 4 provisions closely and that the funding requirements will have to be kept under review, but it is as long as a piece of string. Stakeholders overwhelmingly support <laughs> extending the community right to buy to the whole of Scotland. The RACI committee agrees. We welcome the provisions in, 20, in section 27 to do so. We also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's potential amendments at stage two to extend the list of eligible community bodies and recommend this includes community benefit societies and community interest companies. Poseidon officer, we heard some suggest that the definition of community should include communities of interest as well as those of geographic place, for example, in dispersed rural communities. However, the committee recognises the importance of communities being rooted in place and we are content with the definition in the bill. Registration of an interest in land was explored in great detail and as many communities only start to take an interest in land acquisition when land comes on the market, this is rightly so. Communities benefit from proactive engagement in community development and trying to identify assets that they may need to deliver their objectives. In principle, we are supportive of the requirement to register an interest in land, but re-registration processes must be simplified and should include the option to register for a purpose. Communities should have a right to register an interest and to be notified when land is coming onto the market or ownership is changing, and that should trigger the process of registering a right of preemption, which is a new way forward. The process for late registration should reflect the practical reality for communities and should be redesigned to accommodate this. A presumption in favour of re-registration should be agreed unless there is some material change of circumstances. If the re-registration process is substantially simplified, a requirement to re-register every five years is appropriate. The committee agrees that mapping requirements for community right to buy are excessive. 
Communities need a simplified system to align the eligibility criteria with those in parts 2 and 3A of the amended Act, uh, the 2003 Act, that is. Poseidon officer, the power to extend the community right to buy where there is no willing seller should be a power of last resort. This power could play a key role to hasten negotiation. We are concerned that this new right, as currently drafted, may be almost impossible to exercise. Too many obstacles and opportunities for avoidance on the part of landowners occur to us. Why restrict the definition of eligible land to that which is considered to be wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected? Uh, the committee believes that the draft bill may fail to further sustainable development. Why is a definition needed at all, as the parallel tests for crofting land purchases do not require <coughs> this? Most committee members support tests of furthering sustainable development and of being in the public interest, which meets the requirements. So the majority of the committee recommended that the Scottish Government consider a definition that avoids the wider circumstances that are barriers to sustainable development and look forward to the Minister providing guidelines before Stage 2. If no unambiguous and acceptable definition of abandoned or neglected land appears on the face of the Bill, avoiding the existing legal concept of abandoned land, the Committee will ask the Scottish Government to remove the term abandoned or neglected land. We think it is an urban concept that has little place in rural land use. The difficulties faced by communities in seeking to exercise their right to buy prompt us to uh, seek insurance that uh, appropriate support and funding is available. But public sector bodies, such as the Forestry Commission, must be proactive so that we welcome the Scottish Government's proposal to establish a community land unit to provide support and advice, and that may help many communities to make progress. Poseidon officer, the Committee understands that the Scottish Government intends to bring forward amendments at Stage 2 to include provisions for the crofting community right to buy. We would have preferred the consultation on the crofting community right to buy to have been undertaken alongside the consultation on the existing Part 4 provisions, and amendments to the crofting community right to buy being included in the Bill as introduced, rather than introduced at Stage 2. Beside an officer, we made over 70 pages of report on Part 4, which suggests this is a huge Bill with huge intent. And community empowerment is obviously central to all of our interests. And to make it all the more effective, we hope the government will take on board this committee's views. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Sarah Boyack to be followed by Michael Russell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think there's very strong support across the chamber for extending. I think there's very strong support across the chamber for extending land reform to urban communities. I think part of that process, though, has to be learning from the lessons of the implementation of our historic land reform legislation in the early years of the Parliament. I think as we, de as we look at the principles and the detail of the bill, it's important that we bear that in mind. Because we've got to make sure that the legislation that we pass as a parliament is capable of working as intended and will be able to be used by communities. And I think there are key concerns. I, I want to um, thank the committees for their work. Um, I also have recently joined the RACI committee, but I particularly want to thank the many stakeholders um, for the detailed work that they have done to put together their comments, enable us to process their concerns um, for stage one. And I want to put on record that in terms of land reform, Labour wants to work with those who want to be radical on the question of land reform. And we made it very clear a couple of years ago that we wanted to see new community rights to purchase land, even where there is not a willing seller. So we're very pleased to see those um, ambitions in this bill and we strongly support them in principle. But for us, the key challenge is to make sure that those proposals are workable. And we need more than the rhetoric of land reform. We need more than the rhetoric of being radical. The detail has got to match that rhetoric. And I think that has to remain a key challenge as we move forward to stage two, because the stakeholders that are listening to this debate today um, have given us the evidence that they don't believe the proposals in the bill are sufficiently clear or workable as they stand. The proposals appear to give new rights with the one hand, but on the other, they may in fact render them impossible to exercise in practice because of the specific wording using, used. And I think the committee report makes that clear. 
And that takes me to the central purpose of the bill and the question of land which is to be eligible for potential purchase, even where there's not a willing seller. The, potential, the policy memorandum for the 2003 Land Reform Act and for this part of the bill make clear that the policy purpose of this part is to further sustainable development and to remove barriers to sustainable development. But the bill, as currently defined, puts in such impediments to sustainable development in terms of the land which is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected. And this seems to us to be both too narrow a definition and one which implies that what is under consideration is solely about the physical characteristics of the land. And to us, sustainable development is about the physical and environment, environmental matters, yes, but it's also about social and economic matters. And communities can be neglected when having regard to their social and economic development, as well as in relation to any physical or environmental neglect. And the bill has got to be absolutely clear about this. Now, the Scottish Government today appears to be reluctant to do what the committee wants us to do by defining this on the face of the bill. And ironically, when we were debating this in the committee, it emerged that the Scottish Government was having further consultations about this problem on the very day we were looking at the issue. We haven't seen the outcome from those discussions. And the reason that Claudia Beamish and I dissented from this one part of what is an extensive um, and very strong report was to signal to us how important this matter is to us to get resolved. And we, we reserve the right to have this matter defined on the face of the bill, even if the committee was tempted to follow the, the government's preferred route. I think the reason this is so important to us is if you look at paragraph 220, that the part I would um, say we strongly support, where the committee reserves the right to take evidence on this issue at stage two. I don't know if the Environment Minister will be speaking today. I'm glad she's here to hear the evidence. But if you look at our report, the Law Society, Scottish Land and Estates, Community Land Scotland, the Church of Scotland, respected organisations have looked at the detail of the bill and have strong criticisms about how it might be implemented. And we think there's got to be a clear definition. And if it's not done, we have been given fair warning by stakeholders that in any court challenge, there's a real danger that a court may decide that when considering the prescribed matters, the linkage between the concepts not sufficiently warranted or reasonably envisaged by the statutory provisions or was stretching the normal interpretation of the primary test, i.e. the definition in the dictionary of the words abandoned and neglected on the face of the bill. We've been warned clearly about the dangers of the current approach. So we're in danger in this legislation of giving a new and powerful right with one hand, but removing it in practice, because the detailed words in the bill are wrong. There's another trap in the bill, and that's the clause which refers requires ministers to be satisfied that if the current owner of the land was to remain the owner, that it would be inconsistent with sustainable development. That is um, something that we've been shown in evidence would be impossible to demonstrate and could automatically mean that any community application would be bound to be refused. And that's why the committee wants this clause deleted. Presiding officer, this is a hugely important legislation and we share the ambitions that communities have for the sustainable use of their land but we need to make sure that those communities can exercise that power. And the bill as currently drafted does not do that. As our convener, Rob Gibson, said, the devil is in the detail. And we don't know yet when the ministers will be responding um, to our committees. That is absolutely crucial. We have a very short time scale. We'll be taking extra evidence on the community right to buy in just a couple of weeks' time. And we're scheduled in a month's time to be looking at this in detail for stage two. So we very much need um, information from Scottish ministers, and we need that in detail. So very much we'd like to know in the minister's summing up when we will get that information, because we will want to go back to the stakeholders and look at the details that are coming forward from the Scottish ministers as we decide on which amendments we think are appropriate to put forward, and also to scrutinise those amendments the Scottish Government itself may bring forward. So this bill is hugely important. I'm concerned about our timescales. Um, and if we don't get the detail right, the bill won't do what we all want it to do, and that cannot be allowed to happen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Michael Russell to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And this is a very welcome bill, and it's useful to state at the outset, as the Minister did, this is about mindsets more than minutiae. We can't empower communities by fiat. Communities need to take power to themselves. The job Mr Russell, could you check your microphone? I'm not hearing you very clearly. Officer, thank you. I was just hiding away. The, the job of legislators is to create the fr framework to allow this to happen, 
to encourage those that want it to happen, to remove the barriers to it happening, and to ensure that those who don't want it to happen are not successful in their aim. And I'm going to touch on all those issues in a moment. But I want very briefly to make three other points at the start of what I say. The first is that whilst the word sustainability is on everybody's lips, there is no practical assistance to communities and others who want to understand what that means for their buyout. And it should be possible, for example, to give SNH some sort of statutory duty to help and advise those who are taking on assets about how they manage them sustainably. Uh, and I also want to agree with the definitions that have uh, come from Rob Gibson and Sarah Boyack regarding the difficulty of the words wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected. Uh, they need to be defined on the face of the bill. I think all of us regret that hasn't happened yet. If it is not done at stage two, then the words will have to be removed because they will present an enormous barrier to the successful operation of this bill. Consideration also needs to refer on the face of the bill uh, for ministers to require to have regard to the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights when determining an application. Ministers already are bound to have regard to ECHR. It's important we recognise the wider human rights considerations that land reform presents. And finally, as we are all born-again diggers, can I refer to the allotments issue and make it clear that I think there are very clear, very simple requests from, uh, from the allotment owners, the Scottish Allotment and Garden Society particularly. They want the definition of a standard plot. They want a public sector duty. These are reasonable demands, and they all contribute to the health, environmental and food policies of the Scottish Government. But... Presiding officer, the biggest issue for me in this bill, and for many, is the transfer of assets to local communities. And in that regard, the task that I've outlined to create the framework to stimulate the demand, to remove the barriers, and to ensure that those against do not succeed is very clear. And it needs to be judged against two things. The present legislation that exists in community buyout and the actual practice for those that try to buy uh, property. And I want to use an example which will not surprise people in this chamber from my own constituency, the example of the proposed buyout of Castle Tower. Castle Tower is a large decaying mansion house in, set in parkland. It overlooks the Clyde. It was built in 1820 by Kirkton Finlay, the Lord Provost of Glasgow and the MP for Glasgow. It was owned by the Coates family during the Second World War. It was commissioned as HMS Brontosaurus, uh, perhaps uh, that's rather appropriate considering the dinosaur-like attitude of Argyll and Butte Council. Um, it was a training centre for D-Day landings and it passed to the Corporation of Glasgow in 1948 where it became a celebrated outdoor centre. It passed to Argyll and Butte Council at no cost at local government reorganisation and it had a tenant up until 2013 with a very poor relationship with the council. The community tried to buy it and failed in 2011. There was a commercial bid that failed in 2013, and the second community purchase is now ongoing. The bid is backed by the overwhelming majority of the community, has been backed in a ballot. It has the maximum funding from the Scottish Land Fund. It is supported by Highlands and Islands Enterprise. The Scottish Government has been very helpful via the Cabinet Secretary just last week. Up to 100 jobs could be secured. An anchor tenant is in existence. New valuation that the community has now supports the, offer, the purchase price offer of £850,000. Uh, and the community is desperate to get hold of this asset. But for some reason, the council won't sell. There's even a 10,000 signature petition actually demanding that the council sell. But it makes no difference. Chimeras like state aids and difficulties of the business plan have come and gone. There still remains an intransigence. Now, indeed, it's worse than intransigence. There is a pretense that in some way the council does want to sell. An offer of a million pound loan has been made to the community, though the business plan shows that cannot be supported. And the council has even said to the community that they should just take the loan, default on it, and hand the property back in three years' time. What you describe as more Cosa Nostra than Costa Clyde. But the reality is that this uh, building remains in the possession of the council. Now, if it was a private individual that was involved, we would pillory them the length and breadth of Scotland. But that type of poor landlordism is not unique in Scotland. It's not even unique amongst local authorities. There is a public mindset, the word that the minister used, that property is retained by the public sector and very rarely given access to by anybody else. And in our Butte, that's particularly true. This very morning, I spoke to 
McLeod, McLeod Construction, a big uh, building firm in Argyle, who are desperate to build a factory unit in Loch Gilphead, and the community wishes to have part of that land for community use, and they are also being obstructed by the local authority again and again. There are examples across my constituency of extraordinarily poor stewardship of public assets which the community cannot get hold of. So, presiding officer, when we apply these tests, the tests that I have outlined, then we find that the legislation is not doing enough to force the issue. Certainly, there is a framework that exists, but it's not working well enough. So this legislation can change that. There is demand that exists. Indeed, in many areas, that demand is growing all the time. But there are still too many barriers that local authorities and public agencies can put in the way of communities, and there are still far too many ways in which bodies can obstruct community purchase. Now, whether that be, presiding officer, and I'm just coming to a conclusion in South Cowell with this in Mull, where in one community the local community council wanted to buy the local toilet from our and Butte Council, and we're told that would be no problem. It would cost £30,000 and take a year to process. In Oban, where Rockfield School uh, is for sale and where the community wants to set up an arts centre, or in Loch Gilpin, as I've said, all through Argyll, all through Scotland, communities want to buy assets, they want to use assets, and they would use them better than those of us who stand as stewards of them, including the council. The demand now is to get this legislation right so that that can happen. That's the process of amendment we'll be engaged on. I hope the minister will be sympathetic to it. Thank you. Before we move on, can I advise the Chamber that we are eating into what little extra time we had? Tavi Scott to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I uh, welcome the uh, Minister to this bill? I hope he doesn't spend all of his next uh, couple of years with his lawyers, but it certainly sounds on today's proceedings that's uh, uh, reasonably uh, likely. Uh, we support the bill from, this, uh, from these benches. It would be difficult to be against community empowerment, uh, but I believe that many of the remarks made in, earlier in this debate, not least of which by Kevin Stewart in relation to uh, the principle of trust, uh, struck a reasonable tone about the best way to look at uh, what is being being sought uh, from this proposed uh, legislation. There are a couple of other important principles, though, that uh, uh, haven't been touched on so far. One of them is devolution within Scotland, and I certainly, I know the Minister won't agree with this, but I, I would actually like to see a reversal of centralisation within Scotland and very much decentralisation within this country. We spend an awful lot of time arguing about the principle of what should flow from one part of the United Kingdom to another, but it would be quite important also at times in our deliberations to reflect on what more could be done around Scotland and in, our, in different communities, different areas, and different towns, villages and islands, if uh, some of that uh, happened as well. Minister? In the spirit of returning to that uh, decentralised era when the member was a minister, does he support the return of ring fencing of funding in local government? I'm just going to come on to the ring fencing that he's still got in place because the idea that he's got rid of all the ring fencing is far uh, from the truth and, and I'm very grateful to him for raising that. I'm going to come on to the other centralisations that he's voted for so convincingly over these uh, last number of years. But I'm talking to take a much more broad spirit than that but if he wants to play the politics then believe me I'll be all too happy to do uh, that uh, too. Uh, can I just go back to the laudable objectives that are within this in, in encouraging local people to design, initiate and indeed decide on the kind of services they want and use the assets that Mike Russell uh, was briefly mentioning uh, there. Uh, but I also think there is a role that we should have in encouraging local government too. I, Mr Russell made a very uh, strenuous and passionate case as to the failures of the, of the council in his era in respect of one particular project and I'm sure he is entirely justified in making uh, that uh, case. But I do uh, slightly worry at times when we're considering community empowerment that, uh, that it would be occasionally important to recognise that local government can play a positive role in that uh, as well. And far from believing that local government is a threat to Hollywood rule, as now appears to be the view on some of the nationalist benches, uh, I believe that we should take a rather more positive approach uh, to that. I was also... I also see in some of the submissions we've had that the same could be applied to community councils as well. I was a bit taken aback by reading the, community, the, sorry, the committee evidence uh, on the Minister's remarks in respect of uh, community councils. Um, the, gov the Government Minister rightly asked for ideas and proposals. Uh, one of the ways in which, uh, uh, very strongly I believe, that uh, we could empower communities is by giving law more uh, local government uh, financial responsibility at a local level. That's not just about participative budgeting and there are many submissions which talk of that and I think talk very strongly and persuasively of that but also about uh, local government finance. The Minister
Minister is blessed with a, a majority in this Parliament. He could reform local government finance. He could introduce uh, local income tax. He'll have no impediment from these sides on that. Indeed, he would have our support. And he, more to the point, he has the numbers to get it through. But sadly, that is going nowhere at the moment. It appears to be utterly lo lost in the long grass uh, of, um, of the government's uh, thinking. Yep. Minister? standing invitation to the Liberal Democrats to nominate a member to join the Commission on Local Tax Reform. Perhaps if you uh, return the letter, we can get on with uh, creating that commission. Well, you could, just, you could actually just pass legislation to introduce local income tax, because that's the policy that you and I thought believed in, Marco. So why don't you just get on and do it, rather than not Through set up chair, yet another please. commission? Could we just... Uh, well, okay, if Mr Brody wants to intervene, I'll, ha I'll happily uh, take his intervention. But uh, if he's not got anything to say, why doesn't he just stay there? Um, presiding officer, uh, the point that we really need to tackle in Scotland is to reverse that uh, centralisation. Now, if this bill begins to do that, then that would be uh, very welcome indeed, because there have been many changes that we have seen over the past seven years that have been uh, far from empowering communities. They've taken powers away from communities. The Minister said in his opening remarks, and I agreed with him, that communities, are, uh, sorry, communities around the table when decisions affecting them are taken. Communities must be around the table when decisions affecting them are taken. I entirely endorse that sentiment and indeed that principled uh, approach. But that would also apply uh, to police, to fire, to the courts closing, to other closures that we have seen over the past uh, number of years where uh, communities were very much ignored by this government in respect of their uh, views on those uh, subjects. And uh, I could take a number of other examples, but it just seems to me that if we're going to move forward in this area, there needs to be a little understanding from, um, from the government that uh, the one-size-fits-all approach that tends to come from Edinburgh doesn't mean flexible and responsible local services or local um, assets being used in the right kind of way, and that uh, needs uh, to change. I also want to reflect uh, at what I thought had been a series of particularly helpful submissions from different organisations uh, uh, for today's debate, not least of which the SCVO, who say uh, to members in their contribution that successful community empowerment cannot be driven by a top-down approach. It must be encouraged to, to develop from the grassroots uh, up, a sentiment I'm sure most of us would very strongly agree with. Uh, Scottish Community Alliance has already been mentioned, I, uh, who also have noted that the bill is a missed opportunity to address at least some of the long-standing challenges faced by the country's most localised tier of democracy, community councils. I would commend that approach to the Minister and hope he might give that some further thought. And from Voluntary Action Scotland, who noted that the bill does not go far enough to force this joint work in, working between statutory bodies. So it strikes me that I hope the Minister might accept there's a lot uh, to do. Can I just finish with the point that Rob Gibson very rightly made about the uh, Stage 2 amendments the Government plan to bring forward on crofting community uh, right to buy. We made the same concerns uh, on that on the aquaculture bill just a year or so ago. And Mr Gibson very fairly made that point, as did Mr Ferguson, and I, th I seem to recall Ms Beamish on the Labour side. I do hope the government is not going to make the same mistake as they made on that, which was to introduce big, big stage two amendments without any consultation. That's a parliamentary point, presiding officer, for you as much as for anyone else. Thank you. Can I now ask members to keep within their six minutes, please? Matt MacDonald to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I was a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee throughout the duration uh, of this legislation being considered, uh, although I had left the committee before it considered the Stage 1 report. And having looked at the weighty tome that was produced, I have a feeling I may have made a lucky escape at that point. But I do uh, pay tribute to the clerks on the committee who I think did a fantastic job during the consideration of the legislation in supporting the committee's work and ensuring that we were able to hear from a wide range uh, of uh, interested parties, be they local authorities or other public bodies, uh, and also most importantly from community groups and organisations themselves, both here in Edinburgh but also crucially out there in the communities. Now, I've been uh, enthusiastic about the potential of this legislation uh, for some time, and I remain so. Uh, I want to cover a couple of the areas that are contained within the legislation, because obviously there are a lot of sections, and some of my colleagues have covered in detail uh, some of the other areas. But there are some areas which I think um, are, are ones which I focused in on during my consideration of the legislation. Uh, so I want to maybe flesh those out a little bit uh, just now. 
In terms of participation requests, I think that is, these are uh, extremely important. And the reason is because um, what I see all, all too often is an approach to service delivery which is designed from the top down rather than from the bottom up. And while we are seeing some improvement from local authorities in terms of how they consult with communities, whether that is in terms of the design of services or the delivery of services, or in terms of the uh, formation of the local government, of the local authorities' budget. Many local, when I uh, arrived in local government uh, in 2007, the budget process uh, was essentially a closed shop process. Um, you received your budget papers a couple of weeks before the budget as a, as a backbench member, and communities themselves had very little input into how that budget itself was formed. At Aberdeen City Council, we took the approach of reforming that so that the budgeting process, the public uh, face of the budgeting process started much earlier, and that allowed for much more community feed and much more community involvement. I see participation requests as an opportunity for that kind of approach to be taken, not just in terms of how local authorities establish their budgets, but also how they design and deliver services. Meaningful involvement of communities rather than tick, bo tick box consultation exercises, which all too often is the complaint that we as politicians hear. In terms of asset transfers, I think my colleague Mike Russell, uh, while making a very passionate uh, case for uh, some of the, the issues that are affecting his local community, I think highlighted very importantly that there can be blockages uh, all too often that, that come into being. And I've seen this in my own constituency uh, myself. Um, there are good examples out there of where communities and community organisations have taken on assets uh, or land from local authorities or other bodies and delivered uh, real opportunities and uh, are, are doing good work within communities. I can think, for example, of the Dice Development and Amenities Committee in my constituency who operate the, uh, the old Carnegie Library or the Carnegie Hall, as it's called, in Dice, where uh, a, a range of community groups have access and are able to use that facility or they operate the, the use uh, of the uh, community garden uh, and the provision that that uh, ha has led to in terms of green space and uh, an opportunity for many in the community to enjoy that area. Yet, just uh, a couple of miles down the road in the community of Bucksburn, there has been a long-standing and protracted uh, attempt to try and gain access to green space next to the Cloverleaf pub, uh, called the Cloverfield Park area, which was a piece of land that was transferred to the local authority in exchange for green space that was taken up during the development of the new secondary school. Uh, the land uh, requires work. There is an interest from within the community to develop it as a community garden or community green space area because there is a recognition that there is a lack of green space within the community that can be uh, utilised by, by the people of Bucksburn. But to, in order to try and advance that, it has proven extremely difficult to get the local authority to come to the table and have meaningful discussion and dialogue with the community about that. It looks like, as a result of uh, associated housing development, there may be an opportunity for that land to be developed, but it has taken far too long for what ought to have been a very simple process. And another example recently is that of Victoria Road School, which does not sit in my constituency, sits in Maureen Watts' constituency. The old pri former primary school in the community of Torrey, which the community themselves wanted to take on and to operate uh, for the benefit of the wider community, but the council rejected that approach and have elected instead to demolish that building. Uh, that, I think, is an unfortunate step uh, to have been taken, and I think it flies in the face of what we're trying to achieve through this legislation of allowing communities to have a much greater say, a much greater ownership of what goes on in their area. Very finally, presiding officer, on allotments. Um, I, I recognise the importance of allotments. There are a number of allotment plots within my constituency. One thing which I would highlight, and it was highlighted during discussions at committee, is while there is a requirement on the local authority, we should also remember that there are many other public bodies and organisations out there who have land which could be suitable for the establishment and creation of allotments. And I will ask the minister if that is something that he is reflecting on as he looks to uh, how this legislation could perhaps be amended at stage two. Many thanks. And I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Claudia Beamish. 
Um, presiding officer, I'm, I'm glad to be following Mark McDonald because I felt for a while, as important as the debate has been, it was uh, speaking abstract, speaking in technical, not really making it real to the communities that we all, that we all represent. Um, and that's what I'd like to seek to do this afternoon. A few months ago, I led a debate in this parliament seeking to help boost community-led regeneration in Royston. Royston, or the Garn Gad, as most locals would call it in the area, does not have its challenges to seek. However, it also has many inspiring individuals and organisations who, on a daily basis, make a real difference to the lives of many, many people. Organisations such as local housing associations, Blocair, Inspireview and Copper Works, groups such as Royston Youth Action and Rosemount Development Trust, and individuals such as Charlie Lynn, Tilly and Liz McElroy and Joan Royston champion community empowerment in all that they do on a daily basis. There are many more groups and individuals who do so much in the Garn Gad, and I apologise that uh, I obviously can't mention them all. But I firmly believe that had this community empowerment bill became law several years ago, that community could have benefited greatly. The test of the legislation before us today at stage one is that it has to still be able to make a significant difference to that community and others that I represent. I am privileged to have worked with key community, uh, community stakeholders and on a cross-party basis uh, to help develop a community regeneration strategy to get a forum up and running in relation to that. My thanks in particular to Rosemount Development Trust and to Kevin Murray Associates, who have now brought us to a stage of having, a, having that fully-fledged, community-consulted, community-led, community-designed regeneration strategy. So whether it's a plan for a sports hub and greater sporting facilities or greater connectivity with other areas or better shopping facilities, particularly around Royston Hill, whether it's bringing health care into the community, whether it's a variety of local amenities, whether it's improved recreation and meeting space or a better housing provision and mix, it all has, has to tie together and the community have to lead that strategy. The issue we have found is there's a significant piece of land that sits in the middle of the community that for many, many years the community has had no control over. That land was sold to, uh, to, to a group called Focus Urban several years ago. They'd given com commitments to put affordable housing on that land. Uh, they never came to a hill of beans, quite frankly. Um, and actually, it could be argued that the local authority at the time didn't have a joined-up approach to whether or not that was the best place to build houses in the first place. In recent months, that company went bankrupt, um, and that land was to be disposed of uh, by the Bank of Ireland, who had control over that situation. Political representatives, community stakeholders, we all made strenuous efforts to get in contact to see if the community could get control over that land a key, piece, a key piece of land in order to bring about a fully-fledged, bigger-picture regeneration of the wider local community. But to, to no joy, I'm afraid to say, the land was sold to an offshore company. Actually, that doesn't matter that it's an offshore company, whether it's a, a domestic private concern or, indeed, a local public authority interest. The bottom line, presiding officer, is the community has a plan for Royston, for the Garn Gad, and uh, we will push forward that plan as best we can. But how much better it could have been if we'd control over all the community assets? And much of the talk here this afternoon has been around what abandoned land, what the terminology for that will be, what neglected land looks like. And I concur with some of the comments to say that if it's not part of a sustainable community regeneration strategy and the asset is lying fallow. That is neglected. It has to fit into the bigger picture of wider public interest and public communication within the area for what the, the people of the Garngad want. So uh, I have to say um, to the Minister that if you want to see what a living, breathing community empowerment bill will look like in action, come to the Garngad and see for yourself and see what we have done and come to the land that we no longer have control of in our community. And I would urge you to take up that invite with myself. I say our community, I don't stay in the Garngad. I, I stay in an area called Somerston. So in closing, I would like to speak about a community asset 
in Somerston. Uh, don't worry, I won't invite you to this one, but I will make you certainly a, a, aware of it. Um, there are very few community facilities in Somerston. It's grown exponentially in recent years. I stay in one of those new build houses without community assets particularly been brought in to support it. Uh, one community asset there was in Somerston was a facility which was a centre for adults with learning disabilities, a day centre. Now, I won't rehearse the arguments over whether that day centre should have stayed open or not. I was supportive of the retention of it. But it's a key community asset and a key community location that is sitting boarded up and empty and now being vandalised and going to rack and ruin because of a lacked joined up strategy. If only this bill was, was had become an act and made a reality to marshalling the many community views, which is that site, that building, could have been the heart of community regeneration in Somerston, or back to the story I told about Royston, I hope you'll come and see that for yourself, Minister. That will be an achievement for this bill. I appreciate my colleagues and their technical aspects in relation to how we have to improve this bill. But at the end of the day, it has to do what it says in the tin for the communities we all represent. And whether it's Royston or Somerston or urban or rural, we must make sure it delivers. And I'm delighted to support this at stage one. But if the bill needs improved, we should come together as a parliament to do that. Thank you. Now I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Chick Brodie. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate in the furtherance of a fair distribution of land and assets throughout urban and rural Scotland. While ownership is only one way for communities to carve out a positive future, I'm clear that land reform must continue to be the robust way forward in Scotland and that the Community Empowerment Bill makes a significant contribution to this. I intend to focus on part four of the bill, which was scrutinised by the Reiki Committee, as our convener Rob Gibson has highlighted, and of which I'm a member. And I also want, um, like all those other born-again diggers, to make a quick reference to um, the allotments. As a member for South Scotland, I am keenly aware that the majority of community purchase um, in rural Scotland has been in the Highlands and Islands. Some argue that there isn't an interest in the rest of Scotland and in my own region of South Scotland. I strongly disagree with those who say this. There are examples of community success across the South, from Mull of Galloway Trust to Corehead Farm, owned by the Borders Forest Trust. With, com with um, community interest and regeneration and sustainable development in the true sense of the word, at their heart. And of course, interest from groups such as in the village of Lead Hills for the future. It is essential, though, that the support is in place to enable communities to identify opportunities, build capacity, and to understand how to take forward this process. Thus, the Scottish Government's commitment to new bodies, such as the Community Land Fund, are, as highlighted in the Land Reform Review Group's report, are fundamental to the way forward. It would also be helpful if the Minister today could seek clarification from the Scottish Government as to whether it's considering any review of uh, Scottish Enterprises' remit to enable the same sort of robust support that is offered by High. More specifically in regard to this bill, as a community activist and community councillor in the past, I've spent much time pondering the definition of community and not always come up with very clear definitions, quite frankly. It is a difficult issue. But the committee's support for BENCOMS is an important step forward. And in the context of this bill on balance, I believe that our committee was right to rule out communities of interest and to keep the focus on communities of place. However, as stressed by Rob Gibson, rurality is an issue. And I continue to seek reassurance on this, and now from the minister and also from um, the land reform minister um, in the context of this bill. Such groups as, for instance, Straven Choral Society have members as far away as 20 miles, and probably in the Highlands, um, there are communities with members even further away. So while we've moved away from the postcode uh, issue, we need to really be careful as to whether we might need to, at stage two, look at this again. Sarah Boyack has already focused on concerns about abandoned and neglected land definitions and on sustainable development. And I'm not going to re-rehearse those. And Rob Gibson has also highlighted the issues around registration. But there is one point on registration that I would like to highlight. Simplicity is the key to it all. And this said, though I'm convinced that the committee has made the correct decision to recommend a re-registration time of five years, not ten. The reason for this being that so much can change in a community, uh, especially if it's in the process of regeneration 
um, and more people are coming in and, and things are, can be quite, quite fluid. And therefore, I think that if things are simple, that um, five years should be acceptable. In this year of food and drink, I want to highlight the issue of allotments briefly, although it's not within part four. I know many members have an interest in ensuring that we have local, accessible, fresh food. And one aspect of this is the opportunity to grow your own, especially in these shameful days of food banks. No one can argue against the benefits that this can bring. An organic gardener, I can vouch for the sense of straightforward delight, which is incremental, and that commitment brings from the, the first spade cut to the taste of one's own perpetual spinach soup. Of course, the health benefits of digging your own are widely known as well, and the mental health benefits of being outside in the fresh air, and even though that air is pretty nippy at some of the times when one has to dig. In terms of allotments, to be really clear about this, there is also an opportunity for a sense of community, from sharing seeds to selling surplus together. And in principle, I believe that anyone who wants to grow vegetables should have a little patch of earth to do this on, um, romantic though I may sound. We are a long way from this. And in the view of SAGS, and I quote, the identity and the unique role of allotments has not been recognized, and all the diverse food growing organizations and communities have been amalgamated into a homogenous unit. New models of devolved management and local allotment community control are just arising and should be part of a dialogue uh, uh, about the food growing strategy. Now, I respect the fact that the minister has said today that um, he will look at this again, but I would be concerned if this was ended up going into the long grass because of um, the, the sort of confusion that has developed, because I do believe, um, although it's only one small part of the bill, it is a very important part. Um, finally, I want to turn to human rights, and um, this has already been touched on by our convener, Rob Gibson. Um, in part four, section 48 is a vital part of changing the nature of discussion between communities and, landlord and landowners, and there is a prize now to be won, credible and tough backstop powers when needed, but in the shadow of which, uh, I know we all hope, constructive dialogue and debate towards more voluntary purchase of land can take place. I also hope that during stage two, we're able to take further de the debate about human rights aspects of all this. For too long, human rights have only been referred to by reference to owners' rights under ECHR, but there are many more human rights obligations in ECHR, and they require to be brought to the forefront of our considerations to make sure that these are done in the best way possible during the bill. And I would highlight the evidence of Professor Alan Miller, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, which I found compelling in this regard. There are indeed concerns about the process and about how issues have been brought um, through uh, so far. But I am an optimist, and I believe, you draw to a that, close, please? I believe that if we work together, um, that we will reach a, a fair conclusion for this bill, and Labour will support the passage of this bill today. But in its detail, there remains a great deal to be done, and I look forward to working with my committee colleagues to play our part in making sure that this is the best bill possible for the communities of Scotland. Many thanks. Now, Colin Chick Rory to be followed by John Wilson. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I suppose, as an avowed devolutionist and a strong supporter of personal, community, and country independence, it's an inevitable uh, expectation that I support this particular bill. Centralism and collectivism have no place in my personal lexicon. In general, I do support it, but I'm not so uh, blinded by it to imagine that our governmental structures are perfect. Else, well, else why would I uh, seek a wholly different uh, change to the structure to current national government uh, of these islands? Uh, and continue to subscribe to my view that our local authorities and community groups are an integral part of an overall governance alongside our national government at Holyrood. I do believe, however, that uh, change is inevitable, and I hold the view that uh, political power at the end of the day is a bottoms-up uh, process, and that we have an obligation to ensure that this particular bill uh, embraces that objective. Now, while the general intent of the bill uh, is welcome, I consider that some of its objectives and tenets may need uh, further review in its current construction. I believe, of course, these can be uh, addressed. The Christie Commission uh, recommended that the bill should seek to 
strengthen communities' voices in shaping the services uh, that affect them. That empowerment is, as the policy memorandum to the bill states, empowerment is a core pillar of the human rights approach. And in the course of the enactment, we have to ensure that we secure a greater engagement, a greater participation of communities over de decisions that affect their lives so they can determine what happens in building their community. Now, while Christy was right uh, on focusing on outcomes, I say outcomes, not targets, democratic involvement, democratic decision-making, and democratic engagement at a community level, it is currently, I believe, very poor, uh, despite the laudable election turnout in Fife in some areas, and particularly in decisions affecting, for example, uh, wind farms, it is perceived in a few isolated cases that objections or support allegedly come down to a very few elected or indeed some cases appointed uh, individuals. I'm sorry. Um, they discuss community benefits uh, and, the, uh, and the like. My contention is that more emphasis has to go on local community democracy and ownership and to avoid what the policy memorandum states that communities might have difficulty in understanding the draft legislation of the bill, or as the Local Government and Regeneration Committee said in its report last February, it stated that current experience of community empowerment in action across Scotland is mixed. The presiding officer, democracy, better understanding of the proposed legislation, a focus on, and I repeat again, outcomes, not targets, uh, and continuous improvement, uh, but above all, responsibility and accountability for communities are, are critical. The vehicle, I believe, to support this change, the change in core public service reforms, rests with the current community planning process. These partnerships, these are key conduits of change to full uh, community empowerment. Yesterday, I met with the very senior uh, representatives in Ayrshire of the police and fire services, who play a key role, not just in uh, managing their services, but in helping to empower communities through the understanding of their objectives in, as I say, in their areas, but beyond through that uh, planning process. Now, apart from the role of community partnership in and of the development of a local participative, participative hierarchy, the transfer of public assets, land and buildings to communities is paramount. Notwithstanding the challenge, and there will be challenges, and the need for appropriate fiscal management and recording and the increased responsibility of communities to own and improve the utilisation of public capital assets. All of these, if done effectively, will stimulate, I believe, product, productive activity in, in the communities. Briefly, yeah. I'd like the member for, thank the member for giving away. The member mentioned wind farms. Does he um, agree that in countries such as Germany and other countries in Europe, you've got over 50% of wind farms controlled both by community and public ownership? And is that not something that we should be striving for in Scotland, working with all communities? Mr. Royal, minute we'll, remaining, please. We'll find that uh, in any discussions that I've had on that particular subject, uh, my main tenet has been uh, community ownership. Now, protecting or improving local facilities can also lead I believe, to profitable enterprise. It behoves local authorities to pursue landlords who forfeit a care of their properties and some that are in a deplorable state, a, as the presiding officer will know in the case of the Bobby Jones building a, in Ayr, uh, and so transfer them to, for, for, for the purposes of, uh, to the communities for the purposes of uh, community enterprise and income. Presiding officer, two very uh, brief points. On allotments, let us not be afraid to place an emphasis, a bias even, to ensure the allocation of new uh, uh, allotments go to young people in the community. I supported Bruce Crawford's uh, case for the grandfather rights, but young people uh, uh, can be encouraged to get involved there. And lastly, let there be an encouragement of the social enterprise in third sectors, providing procured services in their communities through the public procurement uh, exercise, not just to their own, but if they can, uh, to neighbouring com communities. One of the, if not the Let's most close, significant please. bill, in my opinion, to come before this Parliament is this particular bill. I look forward to its successful passage and amended enactment.
Many thanks. Now I call on John Wilson to be followed by George Adam. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I rise to speak in this debate and I draw members' attention to my register of interest, which I currently serve as the chair of a community organisation that is in negotiation with the local authority regarding community asset transfer of a community centre in the village where I live in Glen Boyg. That has been a lesson uh, in endurance for many of the communities because the first offer of the community centre was made seven years ago and because of the hurdles put into place by other council departments meant the community had to walk away at that time and were then re-offered the community centre uh, for community transfer uh, over a year ago. Now, this, for me, highlighted many of the problems that are faced not just by the community in Glen Boyg, but many communities throughout Scotland. And the committee, in its inquiry, found, and the evidence we took, particularly from community representatives, that they were facing obstacles that weren't really obstacles. And I think Michael Russell made reference to the Castle Tower situation where a community had come up with plans and had presented them to a local authority uh, and were quite keen to take those plans forward, only to, be, only to find that the local authority was the major stumbling block to those plans being taken forward. The issue for us as a committee, when we examined the whole concept of the bill as proposed by the government, is one whereby we have to make sure we get the legislation right. We need to make sure that all the partners and the community planning partnerships and others understand what we mean by community empowerment. We don't just mean community engagement. We mean real power being passed to communities for them to participate fully in the decision-making and delivery of services within their own communities. For too many organisations, they see communities as a, an obstacle in actually delivering what they think should be done to communities, not what communities require or what communities identify are their real needs. And as I said, as a committee, we spent almost three years taking evidence on a number of issues. And I know, pay tribute to the many community organisations that came forward and were quite candid in relation to the issues that they faced uh, in many respects in taking forward what they wanted to see happening in their communities. And we've, and the committee report highlights that there should be an explicit requirement on all community planning partners to include community capacity building in local plans and to report on progress along with setting out future plans in every annual report. And we hope that the Minister can take that on board and get that message out quite clearly to community planning partners, as well as local authorities and other agencies, that we are looking for community real engagement, real empowerment of those communities. And for myself, uh, the, the issue of community partnership and working with communities brought home to me the work that I did in Castlemilk in 1988, when the New Life for Urban Scotland was introduced in four regions in uh, Scotland, and we found that the community partnership was very much a community partnership of agencies, not engaging with the communities themselves. And I hope that this piece of legislation, as it goes through, Minister, through you, Presiding Officer, will actually see a real sea change in the attitudes of many of the officials uh, that are out there at the present moment. And I think Claudia Beamish made reference to Scottish Enterprise, and I think others made uh, reference to Scottish Enterprise. I too would like to see Scottish Enterprise's uh, remit being adjusted slightly to include the social element similar to that of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, because I think Highlands and Islands Enterprise have shown us clearly what they can do working with communities uh, throughout the Highlands and Islands, and I think that, if replicated in the central belt, would be a major benefit for many communities to not only engage in social aspects, but to engage in economic aspects that these communities want to engage in. 
Presiding officer, the other issue that I wish to raise uh, is the issue about the registration of community organisations. And the, in the initial bill, uh, the minister has highlighted the issue of SCIOs. And you know, of course, for many people who might not know what a SCIO is, the Scottish Incorporated Charitable Organisation. And there is a number that has been attached to those SCIOs. And I would like the minister to seriously consider reducing the number from 20 to a lower number or to a number that is appropriate for those organisations. Because when we talk about community empowerment, we're not just talking about geographical communities. We're also talking about communities of interest. And some of those communities of interest clothes, please. may be smaller than the requirement that's actually placed in the bill at the present moment. So I look forward to the response from the government. I look forward to the amendments at stage two. And I hope we end up with a piece of legislation that can take forward Scotland and its communities together. Many thanks. And I now call on George Adam to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, President Officer. Although I'm not on the committee, I was there to welcome everyone when they came to Paisley to see uh, what was happening with the, the communities uh, uh, within the town. And it is very interesting to see the very varied groups and uh, what was in offer and the kind of work they're trying to do because there are many challenges in our community. But the Community Empowerment Bill is absolutely no surprise to me that my colleague and friend Derek Mackay was the minister when we first started talking about this because he saw the challenges that towns and communities like Paisley have and he could see that a bill like this could empower people locally to make that difference. But one of the major issues that we have is how do we deal with buildings that may fall into disuse because of a change of a public service. Now, this is obviously something that happens throughout the country and is an issue because recently we've had the Russell Institute in Paisley, which was a building that was used for NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. They changed the service and moved on. And as a local MSP, when Paisley Development Trust came to me looking for a project for the future, they asked what could they do? And I said, this is a perfect building to look to try and get access to it and make it uh, to get use again back into the community now. After a very long time and the difficulties that everyone else has mentioned when it is for community groups to get involved in these types of projects, SDS will be moving in to that building as a major, as a, uh, working to, uh, from that building. Now that shows you what you can do, but they were lucky because they had the support and had to work through that programme. Other groups aren't so lucky, and we have to make sure that we can actually use this bill to ensure that we can make that difference and get these assets back online. But we also have another selection of very large places of worship in Paisley that no longer have the congregations to actually sustain the buildings themselves. Now, how do we deal with these buildings? Some of them are of uh, Paisley significance, some of them are national significance, like Paisley Abbey. And we have to see in the future, how do we actually deal with that? Because no longer can these buildings be sustained by the organisations that currently run them and they are of importance to the local community. But I also welcome the £10 million that the First Minister announced in our programme for government and the new Empowering Communities Fund, because this will allow community groups to get to the, uh, uh, the finance to try and develop these types of programmes. One of the very interesting projects that's happening in my area is uh, from a local businessman called Gary Kerr. And the shorthand for pre presiding officer would be, Gary has a very similar view on Paisley as I have. He's very committed, he's very ambitious for the town. And he sees that there are some buildings that we could be using that have been left, if they were used from a previous uh, use. But one of the things he's set up is the Paisley 2021 Community Trust, and they're working towards a community cinema and theatre. Now, this project would be perfect to work with the Community Empowerment Bill once it's through, because it gives them an opportunity, because he's had difficulty going through the various red tape of local government. And local government, let's not kid ourselves, can make things very difficult for community groups, not by design not all the time by design, but uh, they actually can make it difficult for groups to get through these types of things. And their idea is to have a community-based theatre and cinema uh, within the town because there is a demographic of older people who do not want to go to the multiplexes and various uh, parts of the area. They want to go to something that is more traditional and what they regard as a cinema. But that brings me to some of the other things when you're dealing with some of the historic buildings in the area. And, you know, the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations mentioned that they support the transfer of assets to communities, provided that the community has a 
active desire to take ownership of them. Now, this happens quite a lot when you're dealing with local authorities, because they, their idea a lot of the time, and as a former councillor, presiding officer, I can tell you this, their idea of community engagement and community involvement in these types of things is to try and force a community to take a building that they no longer wish to use or actually have, one that they think uh, they just want to get off the balance sheet, and it's a small part of the actual uh, the budget itself. Now, that's not the way to do things, and I think this is what SCVO are saying when it comes to this uh, situation, we have to make sure that the communities are empowered in such a way that they can take on board all these issues and uh, work with the buildings and the, uh, the, the type of services that they want. But one of the other things I want to discuss as well is that during my time of, as a councillor, I became involved in the Remshire Access Panel. In all honesty, presiding officer, I think it was mainly because people said your wife is a wheelchair user, so therefore you'll know what an access panel was. But being the type of person that I am, I got involved and started working with them. And I think it's important that we acknowledge the work that access panels do throughout Scotland in trying to engage you know, disabled people from all types of dis different disabilities, trying to engage with local authorities and give something back. In my area, Renfrewshire Access Panel are actually working with Glasgow Airport to make sure that when people who have disabilities are going in holidays, there is actually a process for them to be able to get on the planes and back and forward within the, the, the campus with no problems. Now, in other areas, you have an Inverness uh, Access Panel been working with NHS Scotland on improvements to uh, Rigmore Hospital. There's also other areas where they're actually working to make sure that projects are fully accessible when it becomes a, when you're dealing with a, a new project, capital project, like a town hall refurbishment, a new school. Things like that are extremely... Uh, can I just finish? I've only got about 20 seconds. Uh, these yes, things like that to a close, please. are extremely important. So I would say in closing that when we're dealing with this, we've got to remember that Scotland's people are our greatest asset and our communities want to make a difference in that area. I believe this bill can empower them and we have to make sure that we make it work. Excellent. I call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, Presenting officer, I congratulate the Local Government Committee on what is an outstanding uh, report and also the Finance Committee, who I think uh, make a very important point in emphasising the breach of standing orders and the lack of financial estimates, something that Alec Rowley pointed out could become an obstacle to implementation uh, of the bill. As Alec Rowley said, for uh, Labour, we support the principles of the bill, but believe it requires greater clarity uh, and uh, more teeth. And I would say more explicit abandoning of a top-down approach for one based on co-production that empowers uh, local communities. This needs to be reflected in the first instance in Section 2. I certainly welcome the fact that community planning partnerships at last are going to have statutory uh, underpinning. They've been around with us for a long time. I don't actually know where they started, but I was certainly talking about community planning when I was local government minister in 1997. And as community planning developed, I was worried about the extent to which it was becoming uh, a top-down uh, process. So I think the committee is absolutely uh, right when they say that the, uh, the, the government needs to be more prescriptive in relation to local involvement in order to ensure uh, the necessary paradigm shift from a top-down approach. That's a, a loose quote uh, from the committee's uh, recommendations. I welcome the fact that the national standards for community engagement are going to be put into uh, legislation, and I'm reminded that I launched them 10 years ago, but uh, I think they've improved since then. Uh, but that's not going to be enough. That's not going to be enough. And I think uh, the final point I would make in relation to Section 2 is that we need uh, to listen to what Voluntary uh, Action Scotland are saying about uh, more involvement of the third sector. On part three, uh, uh, participatory requests, I agree that uh, um, there is too, there, there, there's too much prescription about participatory bodies requiring a written constitution, so I hope the government will accept that recommendation from the committee. And I'm also disappointed that although um, the definition of participatory bodies includes community councils, there's a little in the bill itself that reinforces the importance of community uh, councils. Uh, later today, I'll be going to West Pilton and West Granton Community Councils, uh, one of several excellent community councils in my own constituency, which is probably why I have a particularly uh, positive uh, view of them. I expect, actually, they'll be asking me about um, the bill and how it went today, because they've been very interested, that particular community council, in the progress uh, of the uh, community 
uh, impairment bill. And in fact, some members of that community council have been particularly interested in Section 5 on asset transfer. I think actually they contacted and possibly even had a meeting with Marco Biaggi uh, about this. And I'm going to have a meeting with some of them with some regeneration officials uh, later um, in, a, in three or four weeks' time, I think. And the issue there is that when a community group wishes to acquire some public land, uh, they hope that the bill will make a difference. But I suppose my fundamental question in relation to part five of the bill is what happens if the local authority just says no? And, you know, I think the fear is that uh, it won't make any difference if a public body is determined to realise the highest possible uh, uh, receipt from selling off the land. <coughs> Um, there's also an issue, of course, in terms of uh, uh, Part 6 um, in common good land, that there's no clarity in the bill about if or how local authorities could dispose of common good land through asset transfers. In fact, there's a lot of questions, I think, about Section 6 in general. And although everyone has welcomed the transparency of registers of common good land, there's still a lack of clarity, uh, of course, about the statutory definition. Part four, sorry, I'm trying to get through all uh, the bills in uh, the short time available. The right um, 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 to buy land will be substantially extended. I'm sure that's uh, widely welcomed, and I particularly welcome the compulsory right, right to buy, which gives communities the right to acquire land without it being put on the market. <coughs> However, the Rural uh, Affairs Committee here uh, did some uh, sterling work in pointing out some of the problems around the definition of abandoned uh, and neglected uh, land. For, apart from anything else, that's a bit of a legal quagmire, and I'm sure the government will look very carefully at the recommendation from the Rural Affairs Committee that they should consider a definition that relates to wider circumstances which can be a barrier to sustainable development. Uh, section 7 uh, on allotments. Clearly, um, as Alec Rowley said, we need further discussion with the Scottish Allotment and Garden Society, uh, and we need to link uh, the work on allotments uh, with um, food, um, food in particular and health and well-being more generally. Um, section 8 uh, on um, non-domestic rates uh, relief is obviously linked to some of the financial concerns I, I mentioned at the beginning. And Section 1... Uh, I broadly welcome, not least as a member of the Finance Com Committee, because we've been emphasising the importance of outcomes and outcome-based budgeting for a long time. I'd like to conclude with a quote from the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, because they published Effective Democracy re 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 Reconnecting with Communities last year. <coughs> and I think this is important, obviously, for wider uh, devolution arguments uh, as well. They say that Scotland cannot deliver on improved democratic participation without radical new thinking. There now appears to be agreement that Scotland should have a stab substantially more powers, but simply repositioning control nationally in Edinburgh or London will not tackle the complex opportunities and challenges that communities face. The shift needs to be decisive and far-reaching, not a trickle of power to councils, then to communities, all controlled from above. And I think above in that context could refer to councils as well as Interrupt to close, the Scottish uh, Parliament and the Scottish Government. We need genuine power into local communities at a local level. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Day to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The uh, problem with speaking this far into a debate is that you tend to find most of the bases have been covered by the time you're able to contribute to it. But so wide-ranging was the Rural Affairs Committee's contribution to the Stage 1 report. There are some angles either still to be visited or worthy of being expanded upon, and I'll focus my contribution on these. As we've heard, the major issue with the bill from our committee's perspective is the issue of abandoned and neglected land and the need for an unambiguous definition of these terms. But there were several other areas covered by our report which, although less significant, were nevertheless important. Firstly, human rights. There is a lack of detail in the policy memorandum on human rights. However, from the evidence we took, an interesting perspective in the role human rights plays in community purchases of land or property did emerge. As Claudia Beamish touched on, the committee understands that ECHR does not mean private ownership must be protected in all circumstances. A landowner can be required to cede ownership when it is in the public interest, while still ensuring no human rights are breached. Professor Alan Miller, the chair of the Human Scottish Rights uh, Scottish Human Rights Commission and a thought-provoking piece of evidence giving made the point that we need to concentrate on the wider human rights aspects of the legislation. I would have to agree with him. As Professor Miller, expo uh, Miller explained, the community right to buy does not exist in order for the community to purchase a property or land for the sake of it. It needs to be in the public interest and is therefore a qualified right to buy. And as he observed, if human rights is seen in the wider context 
there will be a realisation that it drives us not towards courts and lawyers, but towards having an environment in which there is more constructive dialogue between landowners and communities. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead acknowledged to the committee that we must have at the forefront of our mind the rights of communities and the wider public interest as much as the rights of landowners and property owners. I wonder if the Minister could outline, therefore, in closing, how the Government has reflected on Professor Miller's points as the Cabinet Secretary undertook would be done. The committee also examined membership numbers and the makeup of a community. We took a good deal of evidence on the registration process and the requirements in order to register. The committee expressed considerable concern over the minimum number of members uh, required of Scottish incorporated charitable organisations. If SCIOs are to have no fewer than 20 members, as the bill proposes, then the reality is a number of current SCIOs will not be able to register a community interest in land, as they would not be an eligible community body. There are communities small and large across Scotland, and as such, there will be time when a well-functioning SCIO has less than 20 members. The committee heard of examples in Inverclyde, where SCIOs of eight and ten members are working extremely well. It does seem, as John Wilson alluded to, that this requirement is unnecessarily prescriptive. The requirement to register was another area the Rural Affairs Committee covered. Much of the evidence we heard called for a simplification of the registration process. However, there was also much discussion over the requirement to re register in relation to communities reacting to land becoming available rather than being proactive in that registration. While I can understand that communities are, unless prompted, perhaps more likely to be reactive than proactive in this regard, I think registration would greatly encourage the latter and therefore lead to possibly more considered decisions to acquire property or land for the community. However, that's not to say that the registration should be conducted as outlined currently in the bill. The committee felt that a simplified registration process would not only encourage a proactive approach from communities, but would also ensure that these communities can empower themselves rather than become caught up in a lengthy and complex process. And if we are to entice as many communities as possible into this, then we need to be mindful that expertise and capacity is likely to be less pronounced uh, amongst the less affluent. Re-registration was a further area we looked at in some detail, as we've heard the bill outlines a need for re-registration after five years, with the same potentially complex process needed to be gone through again. Many stakeholders have concerns over both the time frame and the need for the same process to be completed for a second time. Uh, there does seem a more straightforward answer to all this, as outlined in our report, which is to stick with the five-year time frame as proposed in the bill, but, a but with a simplified process that leans towards a presumption in favour of re-registration. Presiding officer, if we were to retain the provisions relating to abandoned or neglected land, and I do share other committee members' concerns over, over this, unless clear and unambiguous definitions come forward, then we do require some clarity in a number of areas, namely whether these provisions would apply only to those parts of a land holding that were considered to be wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected, or to the entire landholding. What happens where it is, in fact, a tenant rather than the landowner who is responsible for a lack of activity or poor management? Will there be an exclusion for land which is being utilised for recognised conservation and environmental uh, purposes, i.e. natural regeneration for biodiversity or flood prevention purposes? Presiding officer, I think there is unanimity across this chamber, indeed across Scotland, in support of the policy intent of the bill. There are differences of opinion on how best, in practical terms, to best deliver on that intent. But we are as one on the potential for good that the legislation has. And I think our resolve to working towards making the community empowerment bill, as the Minister, I think, said in opening, the best bill it can be. Hey, thanks. I now call on Alison Johnson to be followed by Willie Coffey. Um, thank generous you. six Th minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you. I'd like to thank also those who have contributed to getting the bill to this stage. Um, although I would have liked to have seen a braver bill, there is still time to make it so, and there is still much in it that Greens can welcome, and we will, of course, be voting in favour of the principles this afternoon. People from many different groups and communities had big expectations for this legislation, and today I want to concentrate on empowering the community of football fans who want to buy their football clubs. As a first step, we welcome the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee's recommendation that the list of eligible bodies be expanded to include community benefit societies and community interest companies. This is an important foundation for fan ownership, given the way so many fans' trusts are organised. But a proper fan's right to buy? The bill as it stands brings us no nearer to it, and I do therefore intend to bring amendments on this issue. I'd like to address a number of key questions, and I urge the Minister on closing to agree to look again at what the Scottish Government can do for football fans in this area. Is there a serious problem with the way Scottish football is currently owned and run? 
I am sure members would agree there is. Even those who do not support Hearts, Rangers, Dunfermline, Dunfermline Athletic, Livingston or Gretna. Of course, not all privately owned clubs are operated irresponsibly, but when they are, and when they go into administration or are traded like any other asset, fans are still all too often shut out of the process. We should also have a clear process to ensure that there is a, a clear exit strategy for responsible owners who decide, for whatever reason, to call time on their period as custodian of a club. But wasn't there just a review into this which decided not to make the case for fan ownership? Well, no. Stephen Morrow is a great expert, but as his report says, the desirability or otherwise of supporter ownership wasn't discussed within the working group, which is a shame, but that's the remit given to them by ministers. And can fan ownership really work? Well, the evidence from Scotland and around the world is that it can, and members across this chamber appear to agree. I know Kenny McCaskill is helping Hibs fans as they try to take control of their club. Ian Murray has worked with Hearts. And I know that Bruce Crawford played a key role in the efforts of Stirling Albion fans to buy their club. Many other members will know their local fans' trusts. Keen, smart, determined groups with the club's best interests at heart. But wouldn't a right to buy drive out good owners of Scottish clubs? Hardly. If a club is thriving on and off the pitch, there won't be an appetite to change that. But good owners come and go, and when they go, fans should have first right of refusal to take over. Oh, but isn't this too radical? No, it isn't. Um, yes. In the case of, thank you for taking the intervention. In the case of one particular club that one might say is in trouble, uh, I was asked to submit an idea, which I did, and then found that because they have seven supporters' trusts that couldn't agree with each other, there was no hope of it becoming a community-based. Uh, soccer club. Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, all groups of fans trust would have to be openly and democratically constituted and ministers under advice would have to sign that off. Um, if a small group passed that test, then obviously they would have to meet with the approval of the larger group of fans. But this isn't too radical. The parliament itself, this parliament, has decided that tens of thousands of acres should be available to communities to buy in this way. A brave piece of legislation which the Park case confirmed was within European law. And if large areas of Scotland's land should be available to local people, clubs should be available to their fans. But is legislation necessary? What's stopping fans from just buying their clubs already? Well, as we have seen all too often in recent times, it takes a great deal of time to raise the money. And a period like those set out in this bill, where they're automatically the preferred bidder, would make it far more straightforward. The committee's report quotes the minister as saying, the driving force behind the bill is the view that we can unlock much of Scotland's potential through community empowerment. Of course this is true. It's also true that we can unlock much of Scotland's football potential through fan empowerment in exactly the same way. We need to see fans as a community and football clubs as their assets. And before we consider this bill again, I would urge members to talk to their local fans and see what they think. If their club is being sold or worse, would they want the option of first refusal? My view is this. In 30 years' time, Scottish football could be entirely transformed. We'll wonder why clubs were ever owned by anyone but their fans, and we may be enjoying a much stronger national game by then, by then too. Um, I'd briefly like to talk about a couple of other areas, common good and participatory budgeting. The common good registers will increase consistency across local authorities, but we need more than simply a bare spreadsheet listing assets. Perhaps the bill could require councils to demonstrate how they've managed the assets on the register to meet best value and responsible stewardship. I'd also like to see a requirement to set out how councils have valued the assets and to publish a periodic plan on long-term management of the common good on behalf of the people. And I'd also like to agree with the committee's recommendation for a timescale for completion of the register. Finally, this bill has been described by the government as the biggest transfer of powers since devolution. But real empowerment and decentralisation can only be achieved if financial power goes alongside new duties and rights. The Minister spoke positively of the impact of participatory budgeting schemes. There was support for PB in the original bill consultation, and it has indeed worked well in areas like Leith, where packed public meetings have reached consensus on local spending priorities. I urge him to consider legislative options and ask what specific support the government might give to expanding this report. And um, finally, presiding officer, it is exceptionally important that the issues raised around allotments are resolved. Thank you.
Thank you so much. We now call on Willie Coffey. Six minutes are there by, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. I mean, although I did not join the committee until the beginning of December, I think, like many of my colleagues, the proposals in the Bill are familiar territory, certainly for many of us who were serving local councillors for many years. There are big messages in there about outcomes and what success might actually look like, putting our community planning partnerships on a statutory footing for the first time, and real empowerment for local people and representative organisations to be more than simply engaged in a process but to help define what the future will look like at a local level. If we achieve these aims, we will certainly have taken a great stride forwards, I think, towards delivering real community empowerment. As our committee convener said only a few weeks ago during his speech on flexibility and autonomy in local government, that if communities are to be empowered, those powers must be passed down through the tiers of government. But at the moment, this wasn't happening. So the Bill, presiding officer, gives us that golden opportunity to move this forward to the next stage. What I like about the committee's report is the breadth of different views taken during the evidence sessions and the plain and simple language used in the many recommendations to the government that will hopefully help strengthen the Bill as it makes its journey to stage three. On the issue of setting national outcomes, I think it's correct that there's an obligation in ministers to develop publish and review a set of national outcomes for Scotland, but it's equally important that local communities have the power to define what those may actually be too. Many of those giving evidence asked for this, offering the view that this would really empower communities from the bottom up. This could be as demanding as it is rewarding. On the one hand, as Audit, <coughs> as Audit Scotland commented, we might wish to set national outcomes to assess national progress on things like health inequalities, life expectancy or educational attainment. But national indicators can often mask significant local variations in performance. And as I mentioned earlier, success might look quite different from one community to another. So there's a big challenge there, but it's so important to work in this to try to get that balance right. The section in community planning certainly got some robust feedback probably as a result of varying levels of satisfaction with the community planning process over the past decade. Some felt that hitherto the process was far too top-down, where a collection of public bodies basically came together to map out a community's future for it. In some cases, that could even, hardly even pass as engagement. And for this process to work according to the SCVO, there must be an opportunity for local people to articulate those societal changes that they want to see and for the community planning partnerships to take these up on their behalf. That, in my view, is real empowerment. It shouldn't be a process we shy away from. As Kay Gilmer from East Ayrshire Council said, hold on a second. As Kay Gil Gilmer from East Ayrshire Council said, if we have a culture of improvement, we do not get anxious if communities, individuals in the community or community groups make suggestions about how to innovate or do things differently and better. And I'll give way to my colleague, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, and thanks for taking that intervention. Community empowerment is largely dependent on volunteers. Very often, the same volunteers are relied upon in communities for the provision of many community facility, facilities. It's likely that community buyouts will enlist the same volunteers because it, you know, we're reliant on these volunteers all the time. So I was really just to ask the member and the minister uh, what consideration has been given to the capacity of volunteers and sustaining the number of volunteers required for, com for community buyouts, given that um, only 80% of only 18% of adult volunteers re uh, actually volunteer. I think the member makes a, a good point, and there's certainly a section that I've seen in the bill that passes through the bill on building community capacity to make that kind of process much more possible to happen, I think. Um, for me, President Officer, there are clear signs that the government's proposals are taking us in, in the right direction. Section 5 of the bill allows individuals and community bodies who wouldn't normally be part of the formal process to be involved in shaping the local outcome improvement plans. That process doesn't exclude things like community councils. They have a key part to play in this too. But the committee made its views clear that engagement is not the same as empowerment, and John Wilson made this point earlier. 
and that the government should be absolutely clear about how it intends to empower local people in this crucial community planning process. Perhaps one of the more exciting elements of the Bill is the proposals that communities can seek to take control over council-owned buildings and land, not as a result of council disposals, but as a proactive and positive move that helps the community to achieve its aims. That is a fundamental shift for me in how Scotland's land and building assets are managed and presents communities right across Scotland with the opportunity to lead and drive that process for themselves. There are quite a few asset transfer processes already in place in Scotland, but the difference in the Bill is that the communities can instigate these requests themselves, and I, th I think that is a welcome and positive change from the current situation and is consistent with the Christie Commission findings. Presiding officer, in the time that I have left, I think the, the Bill offers communities across Scotland real powers to shape and develop their local communities, and to do this very much from the bottom up. It will not be an easy process for councils, officials or even elected members, but I think if all of us embrace the principles behind the Bill, Scotland will surely be the better place for it. Thank you. Many thanks. And before I move to the closing speeches, I would just, there are several members who have not been in the Chamber for some time and would remind them that they should be here for the closing speeches, although they are not at this time. Alex Ferguson, up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was very tempted to start by saying that if Mike Russell's contribution represented him in hiding, as he referred to, heaven help us all if he ever decides to come out of hiding. But I will resist that temptation. No one in their right minds, I don't think, could disagree with the overall aims of the bill that we've been discussing this afternoon. Some of the detail might be a different matter, as many members, Alex Rowley, Rob Gibson and Tavish Scott, have all highlighted, uh, as have others. But any measure legislative or otherwise, that seeks to strengthen community participation, unlock enterprising community development, and renew our communities must be worthy of support. And we on these benches will be supporting the general principles of the bill at decision time. As a member of the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee, my involvement with the bill has been limited uh, to part four, and I will focus on one or two reservations I have about that part shortly. But it is clear from the many briefings we have received from outside organisations that I am by no means alone in having some reservations and concerns over various aspects of the Bill. One of those aspects centres on the definition of community, a topic on which we spent quite a lot of time in the Committee. Now, I am personally drawn towards defining, the committee, uh, uh, defining a community by place or location rather than by communities of interest. However, the concerns raised by Inclusion Scotland, which I think it was Alex Rowley referred to, highlight, which highlight what it calls a missed opportunity to give disabled, disadvantaged and marginalised people the ability to participate in community planning, has made me sit up and think. If any groups deserve to be further empowered when it comes to the delivery of local services, then it must surely be those groups, presiding officer, and I hope the government will look seriously at that aspect when it comes to stage two. I listened very carefully to the minister's comments on equalities in his opening um, speech, and I, I do think the fact that Inclusion Scotland and others have suggested that the bill as drafted runs the risk of further disempowering disadvantaged and marginalised groups must surely ensure that this concern is looked at and taken seriously. Driving officer, I, I don't often agree with Joan McAlpine, but I'm delighted to say that today is, is an occasion when I do, because I was also very interested in the point raised by the Scottish Woodlot Association, a body that I very much support, particularly as Scotland's first woodlot was established in my own constituency. But the Woodlot Association has stated that for woodlot licences to reach their full potential in Scotland, they need to be established on state land as well as on private land. Now, I agree with that wholeheartedly, presiding officer, and I hope the government will agree with recommendation 347, which seeks a review of the legislation uh, that currently prevents the Forestry Commission from leasing land to communities for forestry purposes. It's surely logical that just as the Forestry Commission now plays uh, an important role in bringing new entrants into agriculture through the development of starter farms, that it could do the same with foresters. Presiding Officer, Planning Advice Scotland makes an important point, which is that community planning as a local authority function that sits alongside the planning system needs to engage more effectively with local communities. 
I strongly agree with this point, presiding officer, because I, I know that most of the communities that I represent view community planning as the ultimate in talking shops, something that the council does somewhat remotely without much local input and, or, or impact. Community planning is not understood by communities, not across the length and breadth of the country. And given the heightened role that community planning is to play in delivering the aims of this legislation, that is something that simply must be corrected. Tiny officer, I want to talk about part four of the bill in the time that remains to me. Although I didn't comment on the first sentence of the Raki Committee's report when we were discussing it, I am more than a little taken aback by the wording that a bill is needed to remedy the def defects of the Land Reform Scotland 2003 Act. I may be being a little oversensitive about this, but as the convener of the Rural Affairs Committee, which led on the 2003 bill, I might have preferred some wording along the lines of a bill is needed to build on the successes of the 2003 Act. I was interested to hear from the evidence we took that not many community purchases had taken place using the legislation from 2003. But what was clear was that many communities had engaged in the right to buy process because of the very existence of the Act. In other words, the Act has acted as a catalyst to empower communities in ways that, that would almost certainly never have happened without the existence of the Act. And I think that points to quite a successful piece of legislation rather than one that's full of defects. Nonetheless, presiding officer, the time is right to extend its provisions, particularly into urban areas, and we very much welcome the principle of doing so. Where I have dissented from the Raki report is over the committee's recommendations on the power to extend the community right to buy where there is no willing seller. The government's position is that this should only apply as a last resort when other measures and negotiations have failed, and I could accept that, and indeed the committee accepts that. But the majority of the committee then go on to question the need to restrict the de definition of eligible land to that which is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected, and actually ask why a definition is needed at all, believing that the tests of furthering sustainable development and of being in the public interest are capable of testing all requirements. Now, in my view, those criteria also require greater definition if we are really to understand where we are going with this legislation. So, Presiding Officer, I find myself endorsing the Government's position on this as, it, as laid out in the policy memorandum. The Committee's majority recommendation would, in my view, uh, open the door to a virtual absolute right to buy for communities. Now, the Government has effectively ruled that out in relation to agricultural holdings, and I hope it will hold fast to its original intentions for this bill as well. But above all, what has been highlighted right throughout this debate uh, by Mike Russell, Sarah Boyack and many others is the need, the, the urgent need for this government to provide clear definitions uh, within this legislation as we move forward into stage two. If it can do so, if it does so, I feel quite certain that this bill, which in many ways bears a welcome resemblance to the Localism Act 2011 brought in by the current UK government, will eventually receive unanimous cross-party support. And I very much hope that that will be possible because our communities deserve no less from their parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Ken McIntosh, up to nine minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And uh, uh, can I just begin by saying what a, a, an excellent debate this has been. Uh, there's been clear goodwill expressed from all sides across the parliament in support of this bill. Uh, I think Graham Day talked about it, described it as uh, welcome unanimity. I'm not sure it was quite unanimity. I think Alison Johnson said we could be slightly braver. There was some friendly criticism, but uh, we are definitely welcoming this bill. C certainly the direction of travel outlined in this bill, and we'll be supporting it uh, at the uh, decision time today. Not only does it attempt to build on the recommendations of the Christie Commission, I would suggest it builds on the whole devolution agenda and the creation of the Scottish Parliament itself. The idea of subsidiarity and of each of us uh, at a local and personal level exercising as much control and influence as possible over the forces that affect our lives and the services which support us in that. And just as I am pleased the government has finally brought forward this bill, because it did have a bit of a stuttering start, so I am especially grateful for the work of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee and of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And I would thank members of both committees uh, who have highlighted the strengths, but also the many weaknesses and concerns that still exist about the bill. 
I'm not sure, uh, in fact, the minister deserved to have his hard work dismissed as mere gobbledygook by the normally assiduously loyal convener of the Local Government Committee. But there are tensions and even paradoxes around community empowerment which have to be addressed uh, if this bill is to be effective and which at the moment remain slightly woolly uh, and slightly vague. I was particularly uh, welcoming of uh, Tavish's, Tavish Scott's thoughtful but uh, quite spiky uh, contribution. Uh, I think uh, Mr Scott warned that if we're not careful, this could be a lawyer's charter. And there certainly are some questions outstanding. How to ensure uh, robust and democratic accountability when it comes to utilising public resources? How to reconcile local control and therefore local variation with national demands for equity and fairness. And perhaps most important of all, how to ensure that rather than narrowing inequality in Scotland, the bill does not make it worse. And that dilemma was raised repeatedly in evidence as well as in debate. The Local Government Committee quoted from the Poverty Alliance who stated, the most important aspect of this bill is around empowering Scotland's most disadvantaged communities and narrowing inequalities between those communities which are already empowered and those which will require more support. But they added, there is a danger that the bill in its current form will most benefit those communities which are already empowered and able to take advantage of the provisions in the bill. Mr Macdonald. Mark Macdonald. I, I, I hear what the member is saying. However, empowerment does not naturally follow uh, in terms of affluence. Indeed, many of the deprived communities that I represent in my constituency have flourishing uh, community uh, organisations and uh, delivery of services within the community by the community. So there are good examples out there in some of our more deprived areas of communities taking uh, charge of uh, what's going on in their area. Okay. Indeed, uh, good, there are indeed good examples, but uh, as Oxfam also pointed out, uh, there is a danger that participation requests could, they, they certainly run the risk of becoming the privilege of already empowered communities. And it's a problem that certainly I, I, would, I would suggest that most of us as MSPs uh, have encountered in our work. At its most basic, uh, it's making sure that resources are distributed fairly and not according to those who shout the loudest. And uh, I noticed in the beginning of the debate we had a battle of quotes, in fact, between uh, Kevin Stewart uh, and my colleague Alec Rowley. Uh, Kevin Stewart was suggesting we should listen to Ernest Hemingway and trust each other, uh, whereas Alex, uh, my colleague Alec Rowley suggested we'd be wiser to listen to Lyndon Johnson and ask ourselves what harm would it do if these powers were to be wrongly administered. And certainly, uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that the Minister and most members in this chamber uh, share my intention, that of my Labour colleagues, to use this bill to give a voice to the powerless to enfranchise those who are most marginalised. But inadvertently or otherwise, we have to be careful the simple the bill doesn't simply give more power to the middle classes. And I look forward to uh, the Minister bringing forward amendments uh, to address this genuine anxiety. There's a, a parallel concern too that despite the new powers for communities to deliver public services uh, or to control public assets, the processes uh, which are established could simply reinforce the dominance of the public sector, be it council, health board or enterprise agency, a hierarchy of power and empowerment. And this was a concern flagged up, a top-down approach flagged up by the SCVO and the Royal Society. So what I believe emerged very strongly from the consultation on the bill was the need to invest in building community capacity and resilience, a point I think Margaret McDougall highlighted uh, near the end of the debate. And yet when we speak to the third sector, they would highlight that programmes which support community capacity are the very ones under threat in the current financial climate. Which brings me neatly on to finance, because there are major questions, uh, question marks over the funding for this bill, uh, or rather the lack of clear funding, something fun uh, flagged up by both uh, the LGR and the Finance Committee. Um, for many, uh, it's not just a question that there's a lack of reasonable estimates, it's the fact that there's a, it's not going to make any funding happen. It was something I think Rob Gibson, uh, the convener of Raki, acknowledged when he said that funding requirements will need to be kept under review. And in fact, the Minister himself spoke of the benefits of participatory budgeting for communities. But I would suggest that if it's good enough for local groups, surely it's good enough for the Parliament itself. And I would agree entirely with Angus Hardy, uh, quoted earlier from the Scottish Community Alliance, that we certainly should not allow this to derail the bill, but it would be wrong. In fact, it would be uh, a failing on the government's account if we were not to face up to this issue and offer clarity. 
Now, it's also undoubtedly to be welcomed that the bill tries to update legislation on allotments. Allotments play a, a vital, a more vital role than ever in allowing people access to the natural environment, growing their own healthy food, contributing to a more sustainable way of life here in Scotland. The trouble seems to be that the minister doesn't seem to have won the confidence of the allotment holders themselves. In his opening remarks, Mr Biaggi uh, revealed the death of his office aspidistra, and he bemoaned, he bemoaned his predecessor, Mr Mackay's lack of green fingers. Well, I worry that the new minister has inherited this trait. The Scottish Allotments and Garden Society have been calling for five substantial amendments uh, to this section of the bill. But since the minister's intervention, his meetings and phone call, they're now calling for the whole section of the bill to be dropped altogether. <laughs> so I'm not sure... I'm not sure whether to encourage uh, the Minister or ask him to lay off, and perhaps I would actually, I'd like to echo Claudia Beamish's uh, possibly unintentional but very appropriate metaphor, metaphor when she said he must avoid kicking this into the long grass. <laughs> Can I also uh, welcome the points made by Alison Johnson from the Green Party uh, on fan ownership of football clubs that indicate Labour's sympathy and hopefully uh, when, we, when we see the amendments our practical support for these proposals. Supporters Direct has made huge progress in recent years and several clubs which uh, Alison Johnson listed have actually made the move now. But it's, it's impossible to look at Scottish football at the moment and not recognise the problems created by the wrong kind of uh, ownership model. Fans and the local community put the interests of their local club first and there's never been a better time to promote the right to buy for football supporters. <coughs> Now, finally, if I may, I'd like to turn to the, perhaps the most important issue uh, of land reform and welcome the many contributions made across the chamber. In fact, I think it was the, the subject most focused on by many, Mark MacDonald, Bob Doris, John Wilson, many more, uh, particularly the move to extending the powers of uh, land reform to urban areas and trying to exercise, pointing out the pitfalls and the advantages of trying to exercise control over community assets. Both Rob Gibson and Mike Russell agreed on the weakness of the proposed legislation in not defining abandoned or neglected land on the face of the bill. In fact, I'm quite grateful to uh, Mike Russell, uh, first of all, for enlightening me on the fate of my old school, Rockfield Primary, which is possibly to become an art uh, gallery. I, I can assure you, it's certainly not based on any art contribution that I made you draw while to I was a at close. that school. Uh, but he described, he was particularly forceful, I thought, in describing the enormous barrier uh, that this, the, the lack of definition of abandoned or neglected land, uh, this clause could pose the bill. And I'm surprised, therefore, that the, minute, the committee seemed to leave the door open on this issue, with only Sarah Boyack and Claudia Beamish following the logic of the evidence heard and insisting this clause either has to be defined or has to go. John Wilson and several Labour colleagues highlighted the need for social and economic development to be taken into consideration, not just environmental issues. And Sarah Boyack in particular reminded us of the need to learn from past experience. And I'd like to conclude on that very point. Nielsen Development Good, Trust in my own area of East Renfrewshire, uh, sorry, sorry, I thought I had an extra minute, but I'll, I'll conclude now. It's one of the Use best that. examples I know of a community using existing land reform legislation uh, to take control of the asset, but uh, the former Clydesdale Bank in our case, but the legislation not just enabled them, it was almost the, a hurdle, the hurdle of uh, poor definition of too many obstacles in the way, despite the good intentions. And I would urge the Minister please. not to make the same mistake in this, in this bill, but to actually empower Scotland's communities to take control. Much. Now call on Marco Biaggi to wind up the debate. Mr Biaggi, you have 10 minutes. Please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm tempted to join in the uh, quote exchanging, but the quote that perhaps jumps to mind is that Laws like sausages cease to inspire respect in proportion as we know how they are made, sometimes allocated, uh, attributed to Bismarck, but apparently John Godfrey Sachs. But this has been an experience in seeing laws made. And I think I've seen a lot of examples this afternoon of where we generally look at the same amount of evidence, the same approaches, the same opinions, the same situations, and perhaps in some cases we might do things slightly differently coming from our different uh, political directions, our different personal experiences, and that is to be uh, expected. That's why we exist. That's why we don't simply have everything uh, put through by, uh, by, without uh, debate. But ultimately, we do have a unity over those general principles. But if I can go on to some of these areas where we do disagree, I would just gently suggest that the, the, 
the flip side to that ability to look at the same evidence and come to different conclusions invites the question of what would have happened had the government come to a different conclusion would the opposition in some cases have been just as strong in highlighting the alternative in those cases one i would point out which was first raised by alex rowley but was mentioned right through was the issue of the finances in the bill we continue to have a difference of view here as we have said we believe the financial information provided to the parliament on the bill has been the best estimate that could have been provided of the administrative compliance other costs to which the bill could give rise. It's the best estimate of the timescales as well. We have been upfront throughout the bill process. The elements of this bill, participation requests, community right to buy, asset transfer requests and allotments will be driven by the demand from communities and that we cannot predict what that demand might be with any degree of certainty. We know this through consultation and had we attempted to pluck a figure from the air that could have been misleading, confusing, false, it would have led to just as much criticism and let us simply accept that what has been put forward is the best estimates that we can put forward. Now, looking ahead to another area that has had a lot of debate, there is the issue of the allotments part. The government comes to this with a principle that we all agree on here, I hope. Allotments are a good thing and there should be more of them. That's the principle we share and we're working with. Now, looking at the uh, Scottish Allotments and Garden Society five-point proposition, going through it, defining a standard plot as normally 250 square metres is something that uh, we intend to have powers to deal with, to deal with the size, and it, shouldn't, it should be compared to where we are at the moment, which is that there is essentially no restriction on a local authority. When I visited the allotment that I went to, to see, there were some plots that were described as full plots, there were some that were described as half plots, and local authorities have that variability at the moment. The bill would actually increase the power to set uh, minimum sizing, and I have made the uh, offer to SAGS to initiate those powers straight after the bill is enacted. Similarly, the concerns about fair rent, which I think led to Bruce Crawford's suggestion, at present, there is a uh, fair rent clause, but it is undefined. And the problems that have given rise to the controversy here in Edinburgh of rents being increased substantially are happening under the current legislation. I think looking at these sorts of concerns, we can come to some agreement that kicking this into the long grass isn't going to help anyone because the additional protections that are put out here, for example, the requirement to create a, a, list, a waiting list that would result in nearly 1,000 new allotments being generated, is something we want to have happen now. It's important to get this done, and I would rather fix it stage two and continue in dialogue than remove uh, entirely. I also think it's interesting to note the issues that have been raised about common good. Uh, why, common hasn't been, why common good hasn't been defined? Well, common good is a very interesting, very uh, particular aspect of the, the Scottish uh, public policy, legal, historic landscape, and uh, it is going to be addressed in oncoming land reform work. This, however, was an opportunity to take some steps pretty quickly on which people could agree, a common good register, ensuring that that came into effect within five years, and also uh, to ensure that uh, communities, including community councils, are consulted on the disposal of uh, common good. The wider issue will be dealt with in future legislation, but I would just suggest to to Alison Johnson that if she wants to tell councils what to do about common good land rather than the approach of the Scottish Government on ensuring consultation with communities, there is a tension there and had we taken the other route we would have been criticised as uh, centralists. On the wider issue of land reform, uh, Sarah Boyack asked me if I could state when the information was coming in my closing speech. I can actually do that, but I can do that, I have to say, by quoting my opening speech, which was that the Minister will provide draft regulations that will detail those matters which must be considered when determining whether or not land is neglected or abandoned in advance of stage two. The reason it's a critical issue, Minister, is because although we start taking evidence in a month's time, we also have the community right to buy. So we'd like to see your response to the whole of our committee report, not just that one issue. Minister. Reports will come, but the commitment on providing the draft regulations is there. And 
let's, uh, instead of jumping to the conclusion that everybody will get it wrong, let us uh, have a faith that those uh, regulations may well turn out to be uh, right. Looking at... Um, uh, respect, Claudia, I'd wish... like to highlight to the Minister that it's not a case of jumping to conclusions, it's a case of having taken a substantial amount of evidence and not being convinced. Minister? Uh, well, I'm sure the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform will reflect and uh, come to you in advance of stage two. But one of the other issues that uh, Claudia Beamish raised was the issue of the uh, locality. And uh, there's been some uh, debate here, if I can put some light onto this. The issue here is that we essentially have two similar but rather different mechanisms in asset transfer and land reform. And the approach that was taken in 2003, the approach that has been taken on land reform buyouts, has been to use an area-based approach, whereas asset transfer, which is more from the public sector to the community sector rather than from the private sector to the community sector. There is a, a difference in the kind of thresholds of justification. You need the ways of doing it, and it is appropriate there to open it up to communities of interest. We are not being prescriptive, and in that regard, community councils, when it comes to uh, asset transfer, well, when it comes to participation requests, are equally able to to join in as anybody else through asset transfer. There are many examples of community councils that have set up community development trusts which help ensure them against the, the financial uh, risks and which allow them to play a great role. It is, however, something I intend to return to because I recognise a lot of the concerns that have been raised, although I would draw people's attention back to the Local Government and, Reform, uh, and Regeneration Committee who said that a great deal of devolved decision-making can happen already. On that, community planning is an area that is going to need uh, greater engagement. Let's just make a differentiation between the community planning partnership covering an entire local authority where a third sector interface is the best way to participate and what you might call genuine community planning partnerships, those sorts of groups that councils convene at local levels that can decide at local levels and can really involve the kind of local neighbourhood associations, residents associations to make decisions and that is something that we want to see uh, improved. The national standards on community engagement, I did when I looked them up for, uh, the, the, on appointment, I did see Malcolm Chisholm's face smiling at me out of them. But I would say that they were passed in 2005 and there was, as just one point, no such thing as social media in 2005. There's ways that we have to engage with communities and allow communities to participate is also uh, has changed massively. Uh, the committee was very right to, to notice the difference between empowerment and, and engagement, but I would also draw attention to the difference between participation and consultation. I'm afraid I don't have time. Uh, I, I'm just concluding. That is with a final message to remember why we're here, right? Remember that we came into this to empower communities. And that's what this bill's general principles are for. I said in my opening that what we needed was a bit more help and a bit fewer obstacles. So let's just imagine what this will do, the principles. A uh, Scotland where neglecting abandoned buildings that are a blight on streets and towns can be bought out by the community and renovated where councils are empowered to help businesses to regenerate town centres, where everybody knows the common good assets and will be guaranteed in decisions about what's held in their name, where every part of Scotland has a partnership between all the bodies delivering for people with tackling inequality and participation at the heart of that, where the country as a whole, which we hardly mentioned, will have a clear mission for the kind of nation we want to create, and where we have a Scotland that isn't afraid of letting public assets be owned and managed by the communities that they serve. And it would be a Scotland where participation by those authentic voices of community know-how and experience were welcomed and invited to participate whenever any decision was being taken. That's the general principles of this bill, and I hope we endorse them just in a moment. That concludes the debate on the Community and Permanent Scotland Bill. We now move to the next site of business, which is consideration of motion number 12113, in the name of John Swinney. On the financial resolution for Community Empowerment Scotland Bill, I call on John Swinney to move the motion. Deputy First Minister. Uh, move, President Officer. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 12220, in the name of Marco Biaggi, on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. 
The next question is at motion number 12113, in the name of John Swinney, on the financial resolution for the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12113 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 76. No, 31. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.